कौन सा रोस्टर करा ओके <laughs> 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 Okay. Am I audible? Am I visible? Is my slides visible? You are visible. You are visible. I am not. Good morning, Nami. Good morning, sir. Repeat, King, sir. Nalla arkan, sir. Slides audible or can sir? Audible or can sir? Thank you sir. Thank you. Good morning, friends. Greetings from Dr. Nehmi Nathan. Soon, our IMA CGP Chairman Dr. Sengatuan and uh, IMA CGP Secretary Dr. Sengal will uh, start the meeting, and there will be inauguration by the State IMA President Dr. Sengal Milpadi, incoming President Dr. Abul Hasan, and State Secretary Dr. Nath Tiyarajan soon. So, meeting is going to start soon. Uh, please, uh, I request uh, all of you to remain muted throughout the meeting. So you will have Tamil Nadu Medical Council credit hours. Please enter your name, Tamil Nadu Medical Council number, your cell phone number, email ID, and the branch which which you are IMA member, all those things into the chat box. If you have any difficulties in getting credit hours, please contact Secretary Dr. Sindhil. So this is going to be a useful program. I request all of you to utilize benefit out of this. The first talk will be given by me. 
on uh, nipa and dengue so i i'm having another physical meeting so end of my meeting if you have any questions you can please put it in the chat box i'll answer the question and answer session and then i'll leave the meeting because i have to attend another important meeting pediatric meeting physical meeting so please be prepared please be ready to join the meeting soon it will be started by dr sandeep hello sir sir adhe link dhan sir adhe link dhan adhe tb tb la illeng sir adhe வணக்கம் இன்னைக்கு மீட்டிங் இருக்குது உங்க பேரு போட்டிருக்கு
சார் மற்றவங்க செங்கட்டோன் சார் எல்லாம் அட்மிட் பண்ணலீங்க சார் செங்கட்டோன் சார் குட் மார்னிங் ராஜ்குமார் சார் குட் மார்னிங் சார் குட் மார்னிங் ராஜ்குமார் சார் குட் மார்னிங் சார் அபுல் சார் குட் மார்னிங் சார் நேமன் சார் குட் மார்னிங் குட் மார்னிங் செந்தில் சார் குட் மார்னிங் சார் குட் மார்னிங் சார் செந்தில் குட் மார்னிங் பிரசிடன் சார் குட் மார்னிங் சார் நேமன் சார் குட் மார்னிங் சார் வண்டிங்களா <laughs> 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 Sandil, yes, start panel, Lama, punctuality. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, meeting call to order. Now I request Dr. Rajkumar, Governing Council member, to give IMA prayer and efficient prayer. Good morning uh, to everyone. IMA prayer. May everybody be happy. May everyone uh, of us see to it that nobody suffers from any pain or sorrow. I do not ask for crown, nor I wish to be in heaven, nor or reborn. I want... to alleviate the suffering of those people who are burning in the fire of sorrow physician prayer dear, dear lord thou great physician i kneel before thee since every good and perfect gift comes come from thee i pray give skill to my hand clear vision to my mind kindness and sympathy to my heart give me singleness of purpose strength to lift at least a part of the burden of my suffering fellow men and a true realization of the rare privilege that is mine taken take from me my heart all gil and worldliness that with the simple faith of a child i rely on thee thank you uh, thank you sir now i request our uh, director of studies dr p sengutwan sir to give his welcome address good morning to everybody i welcome our state president dr chandramil pari state secretary dr NRTR Tyagarajan and the president elect Dr Abdul Hasan Dean Raipur Ramesh Dr Anburajan and my dear colleagues I welcome this CGP meeting today all of you today the topic is nifa and dengue by Dr K Naminathan crap typhus by dr k raghunandan leptospirosis and flu by dr suresh kumar infectious disease so all the delegates please pay pay your tanad uh, medical council fees and get benefited i once again welcome all the members of the forum for this meeting thank you thank you sir uh, now i request our state president dr t sendimal pari sir to give his presidential address sir please give your address sir ah uh, good morning 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 sir morning sir uh, respected uh, president elect dr amul hasan state secretary dr tya rajan uh, director of studies dr sengutuwan secretary dr sendil kumar and other uh, state office bearers and uh, today's speakers and members who have joined online pro- program <clears throat> first of all i would like to thank and congratulate ema tamil nadu cgp for their wonderful uh, work today's cme program is the need of the hour uh, because we are having uh, 
many many cases of uh, nipah virus uh, dengue and uh, other infectious diseases now so uh, at this juncture i uh, would like to thank the speakers for uh, sparing their uh, uh, valuable time for us uh, hope this uh, cme program will be more useful to the uh, members of indian medical association for the day to day practice uh, with this i will inaugurate i inaugurate this uh, session i wish this session a grand uh, success one thank you very much thank you uh, thank you so much sir uh, for joining among your uh, busy schedule thank you sir so now i request our state secretary dr nrtr tyagarajan sir to give his secretary address yeah uh <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah. Ah uh, yes, sir. So good morning to all. Uh, respected the uh, president, chairman, secretary, and to all. It's been a. Uh, it's been actually two months since the last uh, uh, CGP online uh, uh, thing was uh, done. we had some uh, minor problems with the cgp ams and the uh, academic wing in getting the tnmc creditors and accountability concerning the money being paid but uh, we've sorted it out we uh, we've uh, released guidelines for the same and, and uh, lot of voices were uh, coming uh, uh, i request start uh, 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 immediately dr sayed dr sayed as a kindly unmute sir yes sir yes so uh, thanks again for the opportunity very good speakers very good topics and name in other sir and uh, raghunandan and uh, suresh kumar three of them thank you so much sir for participating and you, uh, going to be enriching all of us and we have already more than 500 we normally have more than 1000 people attending the, the cme programs and uh, thanks to uh, sendil and uh, uh, sengutu and sir who been doing amazing work over the past two years and uh, thanks to the entire team uh, raj uh, chinadur abdullah sir uh, shanma sundaram sir and to the entire team of the cgp who who been doing this and um, uh, thanks for this opportunity nice to be taking part after some uh, uh, quite some time and uh, we'll be getting uh, the credit as for all this and we'll be applying it and you'll be getting it within uh, 10 days we formulated certain guidelines and uh, now what we call procedures to adopt and uh, uh we was the secretaries of the respective wings to take up more responsibility in doing that and uh, so i guess they'll be doing it and uh, congrats to the entire team once more and thank you so much uh, for the speakers for participating and making the cme a grand success thank you thank you thank you sir thank you doctor actually we will follow we will follow all your uh, guidelines regarding the cme activities and thanks for receiving the cme activities which is most uh, popular demand as of now thank you sir thanks thank you yeah now i request our state president elect dr abulasan sir to give his felicitations uh thank you sandil uh, respected uh, president dr sandamal pari secretary dr natya tyagarajan and dr sengtwan sandil and uh, rajkumar chinadra abdullah and all the team of uh, ima cgp state and also the national office bearers i thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to take part in this uh, you know kind of uh, uh, regaining all of our academic uh, tempo in uh, ima state office uh, we uh, always uh, speak that there are two important verticals that is a knowledge updation and the second one is skill development mm-hmm. and we are going this responsibility of knowledge updation to cgp and skill development to ams in both the friends tamil nadu ima is doing excellently well and uh, i wholeheartedly congratulate the entire team of ima cgp uh, to keep the ima flag flying in the academic front and also i am very happy that the topic chosen today uh, the uh, fever of uh, three types uh dengo nipa and uh, typhus fever with uh, you know kind of uh, uh, excellent uh, speakers uh, dealing with the subjects 
I believe this particular seminar will definitely enrich the knowledge and it will be immediately helpful uh, to practice to every one of the delegates who have joined today. So I congratulate all the delegates and wish all of them have a very good day. And I thank uh, Sindhil and the team for the wonderful opportunity to speak in the inauguration of the uh, CGP seminar. Thank you very much, Sindhil, for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I request our National CGP Secretary, Dr. Anburajan, sir, to give his felicitations. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Sindhil Kumar, for the opportunity given. Uh, as it was told by our Dr. Abul Hassan, sir, that Tamil Nadu is leading in so many things. Uh, in our IMA activities. Uh, one of it is the CGP activity. As such, CGP was made uh, to empower our general practitioners to cope up with the scientific advancements uh, in, in, internationally. So we are conducting a lot of activities and programs to impart knowledge to our general practitioners so that whatever they do whatever they, I mean, uh, practice that will be of much useful to the community in which they are serving. Uh, so uh, this topics that will be, we have been taken into consideration are all uh, very clearly being very effectively selected so that our general practitioners being uh, being uh, given all the knowledge necessary for their day-to-day uh, -day practice to be in do it in a very effective way. So I congratulate this uh, IMA CGP Tamil Nadu as a secretary of CGP, national CGP. Uh, Tamil Nadu's contribution is a lot uh, in, 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 in this nation. So let it be uh, go with the same trend and help all our uh, CGP members to uh, impart knowledge and then do their yeah, practice you. in a very effective way. And in a way, this is going to, I mean, the knowledge we are getting through these programs is going to uh, trans, uh, I mean, transform or uh, translated into the health of the public. Uh, that's why this program has to be appreciated. Uh, God bless you all. I really congratulate the speakers today. They are very eminent persons uh, in this country and having yeah, great knowledge in the subject, what they are going to talk about. The, really, those who are being in the, I mean, Zoom today will be getting a lot of knowledge, a lot of their uh, doubts be cleared today. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you for the opportunity once again. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, uh, before going to the topics, like a short uh, introduction about the, today's class. Actually, since we after receiving the uh, approval for receiving the CME activities, since this class was already fixed with all TNMC credit hours and uh, it was ready for CME, so we made this regular CGP class, which is supposed to happen today, we have opened to all members. So this is a regular CGP class. It's one among the 12 classes of infectious disease course. So this also gives opportunity for our members to know how our academic activities goes in the regular CTP class. What is the depth of knowledge given everything? So I request all of our members to hear and listen to all the speakers and get benefited. Thank you. And over to you, sir. Now I request Dr. Nemnaz and sir to take over the session and coordinate the next few hours. So Dr. Nemnaz and sir needs no introduction. Uh, so he is a MD of Ch Coimbatore Child Trust Hospital and one single word to say is Dr. Neminas and Sir and CGP both are inseparable. So that is a lot of important and information. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandil. Uh, good morning, dear friends. Uh, respectable. Sir, kindly unmute, sir. Kindly unmute, sir. Uh, respect uh, incoming president, Dr. Abul Hassan, sir. Uh, the chairman of CGP, Dr. Sengutuan, secretary, Dr. Sendil, uh, Dr. Anburajan, sir, national CGP head, and uh, Dr. Rajkumar, uh, uh, my dear friends. Today is going to be a very, very important day in the history of IMA Tamil Nadu and also IMA Tamil Nadu CGP because today 
is a day wherein you are going to multiply your knowledge wherein our we are the aim of this program is to reduce the mortality and morbidity of infectious disease particularly monsoon illnesses in tamil nadu so with that brief introduction uh, uh, i appreciate our tamil nadu uh, ima and also tamil nadu cgp for taking initiative particularly during the monsoon time to bring about a, a knowledge change to increase uh, statistically significant changes in the knowledge level of the practitioners in tamil nadu uh, they have taken initiated this step and also my sincere uh, appreciation to sendil whenever sendil does a meeting he does it 100% perfect he has ordered for 500 delegates already now the strength of delegates is 500 so this means the energy he has put he has uh, disseminated the information to the entire tamil nadu so that the entire 500 seats are full so those who cannot enter you can contact dr sendil he will give you the youtube link so you can enter through the youtube also so with this brief introduction let me come to the topic of uh, today's discussion i have with me eminent professors dr raghunandan will be talking on uh, scrub typhus and typhoid and uh, you have a uh, eminent professor dr suresh kumar uh, from apollo chennai who is uh, will be talking on leptospirosis and flu so six topics of importance for this monsoon so my first topic will be on nipa friends uh i'm sure you will all agree with me uh nipa is a zoonotic disease if you look at the zoonotic disease in the worldwide every 4 minutes a human being throughout the globe gets at least one person gets a zoonotic disease but fortunately vast majority of the zoonotic diseases are asymptomatic and subclinical they die within that within that particular per person neither the patient exhibit symptoms nor he infects others so uh, globally many of do many of the animal to human illnesses happen only few of them come to spotlight that is some of them come as sporadic some of them come as epidemic some of them come as pandemic i'm sure you would have seen the pandemics of swine flu in 1999 and a couple of years back we had covid both of them were uh, pandemic illnesses most of the pandemics are caused by viruses and uh, this nipa has got three different patterns vast majority they do not have any symptoms or they don't visit a hospital at all and a few of them will develop ili like symptoms ili is influenza like illness they will have mild cough sore throat headache body pain fever and many of the times it will settle down and uh, only a rare uh, less than 1% go in for fatal encephalitis so it's very very important for the clinicians particularly down south the areas where we are bordering kerala to know about this particular illness because uh, this illness the knowledge is going to save you from a uh, fatal illness so if you look at the virus basically this is the nipa virus this is an rna virus the other rna viruses are measles mumps and rsv these are all potential for rna viruses have got potential for causing outbreaks so in the first case was in malaysia it was in a place called nipa that's why it's called nipa the disease the main host is the fruit eating bat the disease spread mainly in the habitat of these bat areas uh, if you go back to the history the first disease happened in malaysia couple of years back in malaysia there was a farming uh, farming development that happened a couple of years back when they converted all the forests into farms what they made is they uh, converted the forest and planted uh, mainly trees that yield fruits particularly mangoes and other trees what happened after the forest was destroyed the bats which were there in the forest stayed back in the horticulture fruit tree linked trees and uh, this agriculture is who had uh, converted to horticulture in order to increase their income they had a piggery below the fruit yielding trees so fruit yielding trees were there the fruit eating bats were there and below which the pigs were there so what the many of the fruits were eaten by the bats and then half eaten fruits fall down 
and the pigs used to start eating this. And the pigs are the uh, carrier vector for these illnesses. The pigs do not die, but they get a disease called barking pig syndrome. These pigs carry this infection to the mankind. So main host is bats, intermediate host is pigs and horses. That's how this disease started coming to mankind. So this is a fruit eating bat area. If you look at the north, the temperate regions, it's not there. So down south also, it's not there. Probably in the tropical regions. So having started from Malaysia, these fruit eating bats were the culprits that the, from there it came to Singapore, it came to Orissa, West Bengal, it came to Kerala recently. So these viruses are present in all body fluids. They are present in the saliva of the virus bats. They are present in the excreta of the bats. They are present in the uh, all the secretions from the bat. So when these half-eaten fruits or the toddy or the sap, what they call uh, this toddy, the kallu in Kerala, when you drink them raw, these viruses from the uh, bats comes to the human beings. So as I told you, bats do not exhibit disease. They are just simple carriers. From one place to another, wherever the bat travels, they can carry this illness and starts causing epidemics. Pigs have a barking pig syndrome and they do not have a major disease. They do not die. And what happens is when the pigs started bark barking, the, particularly in the outbreak started in Malaysia, the, where they had this horticulture and piggery. These people who wanted to, the man was greedy. So they started selling the pig with the virus. Whenever they start barking, they used to sell those pigs. So these pigs were taken. Uh, sir, you are not audible, sir. So during the transport, they get infected. The mortality is very high. Mortality is nearly 45% to 70%. In other words, if 100% get infected, 70% of the die, humans die. Very, very highly mortal disease. But fortunately, this the RO, which I'm going to tell you later, is very low. So the spreadability is, communicability is very low. It needs a vector also. So fortunately, human mankind is uh, has not fallen trapped to this illness. Usually the uh, human beings get the this is through animal exposure, through piggery, or when they go for trekking or hunting, when they take unwashed fruits or drinking raw sap or the toddy, or getting exposed to suspected cases of Nipah. So these are the ways in which human uh, gets a disease. So if you look here, from the natural words, fruit bats, it can either direct directly to man by consuming fruits or through pigs. From then, from that, man-to-man -man transmission happens, which happened a couple of years back in Kerala. So basically, the symptoms are very vague. You get a sudden onset of high-grade fever with headache. Some of them go in for mental confusion, drowsiness, disorientation. Very rarely, they go into coma and sudden death. So if you look at the pathophysiology, the virus enters through the nasal epithelium. From the nasal epithelium, it goes anti-grade through the olfactory nerve to the brain. So to suspect a Nipah, fever is 100% present in all cases. So when somebody gets a sudden onset of high-grade fever with intense headache, severe myalgia, with or without dizziness and drowsiness, you have to keep a suspicion of Nipah in the back of the mind, not in all cases. Wherever who have gone to orchard, or gone for trekking, or gone for mountaineering, or had a contact with a suspected case, or recently having traveled to Malapuram or Koli Kod, the areas where Nipah is endemic. So you have to be very, very careful because suddenly from this state, they can go into sudden altered sensorium, encephalitis, coma, and death. So you have to suspect early, particularly in the districts where, Tamil Nadu districts where we are bordering Kerala. So, 
many a times in the past we were thinking it was japanese b encephalitis we didn't do identification of nipa now many a times this nipa has been closely related to those who are suspected je the actual virus was nipa so if you look at the indian experience regarding the lab parameters many of the cases in the northeast and also in kerala had a normal cbc leukopenia was present only in 11% of the cases you know many of the viral illnesses leukopenia is a prominent finding whereas in nipa it's not that prominent particularly in indian setting and thrombocytopenia was around 30% many of them had elevated liver enzymes though this virus is a neurotropic and pulmotropic it affects the brain and the lungs it has a prediction for liver also if they got respiratory symptoms if you take an x ray you will have an ards like picture and though the confirmation is by blood or csf by rt pcr or nipa antibodies i'll tell you about this confirmation test later in my slide so here whenever you have a suspected case of nipa please do these four things one is you need to take at least one of the four samples and it has to be done within four days of suspicion of nipa and it has to be sent by bio safety precaution and only you are taking also you have to wear a uh, full cover dress like as we did for covid ppe is very very important and when you are sending the sample it has to be sent to nib pune with a detailed history in a prescribed format that's very very important history and the format is very very important when you are sending sample to nib pune national institute of virology the four samples are throat swab that is taken from the positive pharyngeal wall transported through viral transport media number 1 and other three samples are urine blood and csf they are all sent in sterile containers urine in 10 ml csf 1 ml and blood 5 ml these things has to be sent to nib pune with a prescribed format with a detailed history this is the thing what you need to do suppose if you are in a government medical college or in a private practice so whom you suspect nipa you have to follow this guidelines and the main say of nipa management is supportive as i told you was majority for asymptomatic subclinical they do not require any treatment ili like picture symptoms you need to keep them isolate them and then if they are not sick you can manage them at home only supportive therapy if the patient has got poor prognostic signs you have to be very very cautious the most important of them is altered mental status unconscious level and a respiratory distress you need to admit them you need to isolate them you need to inform the health authorities you need to take uh, samples the four samples i told you and then start the patient on ribavirin ribavirin reduces the hospital stay and also reduces the need for ventilation and also ventilation duration newly a uh, new drug called monoclonal antibody m102.4 has been found out to be very useful though there were many drugs uh, that were tried for covid were also tried for nipa but they were not uh, did not have a very good evidence so coming to the last few slides so if you look at the r0 of any disease if it is more than one that disease has got potential for causing pandemics and epidemics fortunately nipa or zero is only 0.4 so epidemics are less likely but the knowledge for suspecting nipa and managing nipa has to be in epidemic promotion inside the tamil nadu because we are we are bordering kerala so any time we can get it so i at this juncture i like to appreciate the government of tamil nadu for taking rapid steps in educating all the doctors and a public education is very very important because it is the public education that is going to reduce the severity of the disease particularly what we did during covid in fact the ima and the iap started educating the public and also doctors even before the corona outbreak i was one of the few doctors throughout the country doing corona education even before the covid started appearing in india so in hospital as i told you you have to isolate you have to in intimate the health authorities that's two very very important eyes and as i told you at present we don't have any vaccine there is a promising mrna vaccine that is in the pipeline 
and also another vaccine that's in use in australia for in the veterinary in the piggeries so these two vaccines are promising probably in years to come you'll be getting these vaccines so let me go to the next important topic that's on dengue please remember dengue is not a platelet disease let me start with this uh, very very important point i'm going to talk about a disease that is which is not a platelet disease my approach during this seminar is going to be d approach that's three d's one is do's another is don'ts that is third is definite with the if you follow this 3d approach for dengue you will be successful in managing the dengue and your mortality out of this dengue particularly in your clinic or your hospital is going to be zero a uh, collectively entire tamil nadu if you are able to manage do this do's and don'ts and definite treatment you can reduce the mortality of dengue in tamil nadu to zero so these are based on government of india guidelines national vector borne disease control program and who guidelines friends once again i like to bring warm greetings from coimbatore child trust children's hospital this is going to be evidence based approach and uh, this slide is very very important i request all of you to take a picture and keep a color print out and keep it on your table this slide will tell you about the illness management when to do when not to do when to admit when to discharge everything in a single slide basically dengue is a 11 day illness if you get a fever of beyond 11 days think of beyond dengue in dengue in hlh you can have a disease beyond 11 days generally dengue is not a 11 day disease beyond 11 days its uh, uh, fever is probably non dengue if you look at the first 3 days it's a febrile part during the febrile part child be having a high grade fever probably child has a headache muscle pain body pain it's called break bone fever and classically the headache is retro orbital headache if the child can verbalize child will tell kannuk pinnadi valikudhu doctor so during the febrile period please remember the only thing you need to do is to give paracetamol the two if it is a younger child try to give paracetamol at the dose of 10 mg per kg per dose not to exceed 80 mg per kg per day because dengue is a hepatotropic virus many of the admissions in our hospital during the dengue pandemic dengue epidemics were due to paracetamol poisoning rather than due to dengue so please give a reduced dose of paracetamol do not worry about the height of fever educate them about the hydration because hydration is the most important thing in a younger child you need to give who reduce ors which contain sodium of 75 milligrams in older child you can give who ors the dose of ors is 50 ml per hour in younger children and the older children it's 100 ml per hour so only two drugs one is paracetamol lower dose second is ors never give nsaids because many a times when you give nsaids fever will come down the child will have thrombosthenia child will have a major bleeding in spite of having a normal platelet count so do not give nsaids to reduce fever in particularly in dengue during a dengue outbreak do not use mefenamic acid because mefenamic acid can cause thrombosthenia and also in children less than 5 years it can induce seizures by itself mefenamic acid is a seizurogenic drug so i request all the doctors in tamil nadu particularly when you have a child with uh, viral fever please use paracetamol do not use any other drug other than paracetamol do not give im injection paracetamol to satisfy the parents because the child is in uh, in the prodromal phase of a viral illness like polio your injection can cause a provocative polio your whole practice will be lost never satisfy the patients by giving im injection never use steroids probably period only paracetamol and ors very very important the only only complication is dehydration make sure the child passes urine every six hours at least four to six times a day that's the only thing you need to tell another important thing is do not do cbc on day one because most of the time cbc will be normal but the child be abnormal and the changes in the cbc happens by around third day during the disappearance of fever if at all you want to do a child is having high grade fever if at all you want to do a single test on day one of fever it should be urine microscopy it's not cbc and please remember 
viremia takes first three days to disappear. By at the time of disappearance of viremia, the NS1 which appears within hours of viremia, within hours of starting fever, disappears by around third day when IgM started appearing. The IgM neutralizes the viruses and NS1 disappears. NS1 is nothing but non-structural glycoprotein that is seen during the viremia. So if you do NS1, many of the dengue illnesses, children with dengue virus, NS1 would be positive. Another important message is during the febrile period, if you suspect dengue, we do NS1. Just do not admit the child just because NS1 is positive. Because nearly around 70% of the dengue are subclinical. They, they have only fever. Otherwise, child does not develop any danger signs. Only minority develop danger signs. NS1 is present positive means it means dengue virus is there in the child's body. It doesn't mean child has got a disease. So do not admit the child unless the child has got danger signs. Just because fever is there, child is active, child taking food, urine output is food, no danger signs. Do not admit just because NS1 is positive. And also NS1 you have to do by ELISA method. Do not do by card test because you got lots of false positivity when you do by card test. So that's about febrile period. Febrile period, very simple. Treat like any other virus. Give lower dose of paracetamol. Give in no other drug other than ORS. The coming to the next three days, third day to sixth day. This is the very, very crucial part of the dengue management. If you miss the boat, you land up in failure. So third day to sixth day, particularly the time when fever disappears. If you look at the fever graph, there is a camel hump pattern, biphasic fever. Pinadi mudugula, whatever is in Kila mudugula, under the mill, or the mill, pinadi or the mill, Adamati, it's a camel hump, whatever the Adamati on the fever, la the patan complication. So during febrile period, every child that walks into your chamber, whether you've got a simple 10 by 10 consultation room, you have to educate them. Education is the most important thing. Tell them about warning signs. I'll tell you what are the warning signs in the next slide. You educate them and send them home. Tell them even if there is no fever, they have to come back if there is a warning sign. Please remember in dengue, the complications start 24 to 48 hours after the disappearance of fever. And abdominal pain is the most important sign that prompts you to admit the child and start on treatment. In any child who had a high grade fever, fever disappeared, child gets an abdominal pain, please keep dengue in the back of the mind. Make the child lie down, put your hand on the right hypochondrium, feel for liver. If there is a tender hepatomegaly, do not send them back. Do not give them ranitidine, do not give them antacid. This is nothing but child slipping into second stage of dengue or called critical stage of dengue or a leaky phase of dengue. This child needs hospitalization. So during this time, these children go in for shock, they go in for bleeding manifestation, they go in for organ impairment, particularly liver and the kidney. So tissue hypoxemia is very, very important complication. Many of the children go in for shock. Another important thing which we need, we need to know about dengue shock is that these children can walk with shock. They'll come to you walking with shock. So whereas in septic shock, the child be lifted up and brought to hospital. Whereas in a dengue shock, they'll be walking with shock. That's another important thing. And if you look at the SpO2, SpO2 would be normal. If you look at the systolic pressure, systolic pressure would be normal. Only the diastolic will go up and the pulse pressure will become narrow. So you have to be very, very careful. The child be smiling at you in a severe shock. So CNS involvement will not be there in dengue shock. So they'll be saying good morning, but the child be in shock. That's very, very important. Coming to the lab parameters in shock, the most important thing is whenever you look at the CBC, first thing you need to see is hematocrit. Never look at the platelet. Hematocrit, suddenly it will start rising. So hematocrit rises means there is a efflux of fluid from the intravascular compartment to the extracellular compartment. There is a hemoconcentration inside the intravascular compartment. So that means there is a leak that's going on because of the antibody induced antigen antibody induced vasculitis, capillary leak, there'll be intravascular degeneration, hematocrit suddenly starts increasing. If you have a hemoglobin of 12, the hematocrit usually is 36. 
three times into three. So if there is a hematocrit that is beyond 40 or 42, that is a hemo concentration. So child who is safe or bright after three days of fever, please admit the child. Whenever the hematocrit goes up, we just keep the child inside. Particularly, this is one among the warning signs. And the other warning signs I'll tell you later. Coming to the thrombocytopenia, please remember right from the beginning, I'm telling you, dengue is not a platelet disease. This thrombocytopenia is because of a pattern called molecular mimicry. By around third day, our start, body starts producing IgM. For the postgraduates, IgM starts appearing in the body by around third day. It will disappear by around three months. IgG starts appearing by our seventh day. It will disappear by 70 years, lifelong. So that's a mnemonic. Three days, three months, seven days, 70 years. This thrombocytopenia is because of molecular mimicry. The IgM antibodies that are produced over body are supposed to destroy dengue virus. Since the platelets have got same molecular pattern as that of dengue virus, instead of destroying the virus, it destroys our own platelets. So more thrombocytopenia means more IgM antibodies. It does not have any clinical correlates. Please remember, you can have very sick children children with bleeding with a normal platelet count, and you can have normal children with a low platelet count. So platelet count is not an indication for starting platelet transfusion, or thrombocytopenia is not an indication for referral. If the child does not have danger signs, you can manage thrombocytopenia as, as a simple dengue protocol. You need not give platelet transfusion. And your referral has to be based on the danger signs. Even if the platelet count is normal, if the child has got danger signs, please refer them early. Because by referring early, you can reduce deng uh, dengue mortality in Tamil Nadu to zero. So that's what we aim. Our long-term aim is to do that. And our uh, Ministry of Health, uh, Tamil Nadu is doing a wonderful work. And also IMA Tamil Nadu, IAP Tamil Nadu are joining hands with them to educate the, all the doctors and public so that in near future, we will be the first state in the country to arrive, achieve a zero mortality in dengue. So having seen this, whenever you look at the CBC, please look at the hematocrit, not the platelet count. And many a times you find in dengue, you have leukopenia, the total count becomes low. This low, low platelet count, uh, low WBC count is because of this simple fact. These viruses, dengue virus enter into WBC, when a one single virus enters into WBC, it multiplies to lags and kills the WBC, makes a puzzle and ruptures comes out. These one lag viruses enter into more WBCs. So the viremia is enhanced by the presence of WBC helps to enhance the viremia. So what the body does is, body down-regulates the production of WBC. So there is a leukopenia, so less viremia, so less the disease. That's a protective mechanism by the body. That's why you get a leukopenia. So having seen this very, very important slide, please take a picture of this. Or at the end of the meeting, you can send a WhatsApp message to me. I'll send you the slides. So I'm going to, as I told you, three Ds. First two Ds are do diagnose viral fever by applying your knowledge. Do not misuse antibiotics. And another important do you need to do is you need to educate them about danger signs and keep a watchful eye, particularly after the disappearance of defervescence of fever. Don't do CBC on day one. Prescribe only antipyretics, only parastamol. And definitely, you must know that this is an evolving illness. The complications can arise in few of the children with viral fever. They have got a dengue-like illness. That unnecessarily do not give antibiotics. These two are definites. So let's these, look at these WHO uh, recommendations. Children with, with or without warning signs can become severe dengue with plasma leak, hemorrhage, and organ impairment in a matter of hours. So dengue needs a close observation, particularly when you keep them inside the hospital. So these are the center six or the danger signs. Danger signs can be classified according to the organ systems. I'm going to tell you about the five important danger signs. Please write down in Tamil and ask every patient who comes with the cell phone to take a picture. And you have to write this in seven places. 
on your consultation room, behind the door, in the medical shop, in the lab, everywhere where they go, they have to look at these danger signs. If we educate them about these danger signs, we can reduce the mortality of dengue to zero. One is CNS. In CNS, younger child excessive irritability or older child excessive drowsiness. Is a danger sign. Second is cardiovascular. Ask the parent to keep one hand on the chest, another hand on the feet, and see the difference between two temperatures. If the chest is very hot, the abdomen is very hot, and the feet are very cold, that means the child is going for shock. CRT will be prolonged. You have to lift the limb above the heart level and press it with your thumb for a few seconds and see the uh, capillary refill time. If the capillary refill time is prolonged, this child needs hospitalization, cardiovascular. And the third is abdominal. If the child has got severe abdominal pain, particularly involvement of the entrapment of the liver inside a tense capsule, by the time of disappearance of fever, is an important warning sign, nausea, vomiting, is another important vomiting sign, warning signs, abdomen. And the fourth is renal, renal urine output. The normal GFR is at one ml per kg per hour. That is a 10 kilo child should pass 60 ml every six hours. If the urine output is less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour, in fact, if it is less than one ml per kg per hour, the child has not voided urine for more than six hours or eight hours. It's a candidate to be admitted. So renal. And the last is hematological. In hematological, you got clinical. In clinical, if there is a minor bleed or a major bleed, you need to admit them. Or if the child has got sudden increase in the hematocrit, you need to keep the child inside the hospital. These five important danger signs has to be educated to the parents and then tell them, even in the absence of fever, if these danger signs are there, even only is there, please come back around the clock, 24 hours. Or if you have a clinic, Tell them that go to government hospital nearby or a PSC or a GH so that the parents' education about the danger signs is very, very important. Because having gone throughout the globe, I myself, through the WHO, I've gone throughout the globe. Smaller countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, they have reduced the mortality to nearly zero just by public education. So this education is very, very important. I once again stress every practitioner who is attending this meeting to write down in Tamil and educate all the parents about these danger signs. Whatever, not only in this viral fever, any viral fever, if there are danger signs, that means child is losing the war. They have to come back for admission. This public education will reduce the mortality to zero. So the important message is educate every patient about warning signs. And uh, always write in Tamil and ask them to come back if there is danger signs, even in the absence of fever. Never give IM injections and do not give IV fluids as an outpatient. If you have a clinic and do not give morning IV fluid, evening IV fluid, because dengue is a continuous disease. There will be leak 24 hours from the intravascular compartment to the extravascular compartment. Because when we did uh, post-mortem analysis, we found out those children who receive BDIV fluids increase the mortality rate. So always admit them, give 24 hours IV fluids. And definitely you need to monitor them clinically and hematologically because then child with simple dengue can become severe dengue in a matter of hours. So I request all of you to do a simple test called HES test or a tonic or test. Uh, during the uh, question and answer session, I'll tell you what to how to do tonic or test. And please remember, when you do NS1, do by ELISA method. And remember that NS1 means there is dengue virus inside the body. Do not admit the child just because NS1 is positive. The child is a well child. Only when there is danger sign, you can admit. Otherwise, you educate them, come back if there is a danger sign. And then from today, focus on platelets. Do not focus on platelets, focus on the patient. Dengue is not a platelet disease. You can have a severe dengue with a normal platelet count. You can have a normal child with a low platelet count. And always gold standard is to do IgM, IgG by ELISA method after fifth day. So suppose if you have a child who has a suspected dengue, do not wait for the reports. 
based on a clinical judgment, you can write it as dengue-like illness, start the treatment. What the WHO says is, even before waiting the, wait to get the report, whether it is dengue or not, start the treatment. Because many a time, there are some viruses that behaves like dengue, but the serology would be negative. But the WHO mentions that the management as per WHO protocol is mandatory. If you think the child has got danger signs, keep the child inside and start IV fluids. And during the febrile period, I already told you about very, very important points. Most important do is, don't is, do not encourage commercial fluid. Many mothers come and tell you, my child will drink Fanta or Limca or Coca-Cola. My child will not drink tender coconut water or ORS. Do not encourage commercial drinks because they contain more than 10% of glucose that will cause cerebral edema. So do not encourage commercial drinks. And uh, never yield to parental pressure because many at the time they will risk uh, uh, request you to give IM injection or any other drug to reduce fever. Please remember, fever is not a disease per se. It is the underlying disease that causes mortality, not the fever. So do not chase the fever. Make an evidence-based diagnosis and educate them. That's the most important thing. And this algorithm is very, very important. I request everyone to take a picture of this. Whenever you suspect a child with dengue with warning signs, first thing you need to do is, when you put an IV line, take CBC. Look at the hematocrit. Start on normal saline. Normal saline is a fluid that has to be started. Always normal saline, normal saline, normal saline. The dose is 7 to 10 ml per kg. It has to be given slowly over one hour. Do not give a push until the child is in severe shock. Normally, with danger signs, give it over one hour. Then at the end of one hour, repeat a CBC. Look for hematocrit. If the hematocrit started increasing, decreasing from 42, it has become 40. That means you are on the right track. Look for the vital signs, particularly look at the pulse volume, look at the urine output, look at the heart rate, look at the respiratory rate, look at the pulse pressure, difference between systolic and diastolic. If there is no improvement in hematocrit or other clinical parameters, the child remains cold and clammy, not past urine. You are advised to give second bolus of 10 ml per kg weight of normal saline or another one hour. After second bolus, if there is no improvement, that is a child whom you had to refer to higher center where there is PACU. Do not keep them in a small hospital where you don't have facility to go for further investigation and management. So after second bolus, the child continues to have hypotension or a shock. You need to refer to higher center. In centers like us where we have PACU, we see whether there is a sudden drop in hematocrit after second bolus. If there is a more than 10 to 20% drop, this child has got occult bleeding. We give freshly transfused packed RBC at 10 ml per kg, even without a clinical bleed, because that, that can prevent a major bleed. If there is a sudden increase in hematocrit, that means child is going for very severe leak, we give colloid, preferably FFB at 10 ml per kg. So, if there is no improvement after two boluses, do not keep them in your hospital. And there, there is an improvement on the other arm. You can, if the pulse is stable, CRT is becoming normal, peripheries are becoming warm, there is a good urine output, hematocrit is dropping down. Every three hours, you can gradually reduce from 10 ml to 7 ml per hour over two hours, then reduce to 5 ml per hour over next two, to two hours, then gradually reduce to 3 ml per hour. From 10 ml, do not come to 1 ml. Gradually, you have to reduce. And then uh, try to encourage oral feeds as early as possible. The child is able to oral, accept oral fluids, change it to oral fluids as early. Because continuing IV fluids beyond the critical phase, during the recovery phase, you will land up in pulmonary edema. That's called hydrogenic pulmonary edema. If you give IV fluids during the febrile phase without danger signs, you will land up in compartment syndrome. So IV fluids has got very, very narrow therapeutic index. It has to be given only for 48 to 72 hours. The do's and don'ts are do monitor hematocrit, do monitor IO chart, try to maintain above one ml per kg per hour. Do not rely upon systolic BP. As I told you, many a times it be normal. The rise will be rise and the pulse pressure will be narrow. 
SPO2 in many of the children, even with shock in dengue, will be near normal. So always do not rely upon sensorium because even in our hospital, now we have a child, a three-year-old child uh, going for pre-KG. Uh, now having severe dengue shock, but this morning said, good morning, doctor. So sensorium will be nearly preserved in dengue shock. And they can walk with shock. The only fluid you need to start is normal saline, normal saline, normal saline. Do not start on dextrose containing fluid because you will land up in neuroendocrine stress phenomenon. And never give platelet prophylactic platelets. And also another important point, do not give drugs to improve platelet count. Dengue is not a platelet disease. Forget platelet, focus patients. So last carry home message, as I told you, do not give BDIV fluids. Monitor inpatient carefully. Dengue ships from single, simple dengue to severe dengue in a matter of hours. Forget platelets, focus patients. Reference should not be based on the clinical condition and not based on the platelet count. So it is the disease that causes fever that kills a child. Do not chase the fever. And uh, I request all the doctors to do a triage for every fever patients. It takes less than 30 seconds. Please do CCTVR. Look at, look at the pulse volume, capillary rebuild time, color of the child, temperature of the extremities. If you are able to do this, even an uneducated person who is in your clinic as a receptionist, they can do this CCTVR. If they can do this, if you can identify a sick child, bring the child inside, even in a busy OP. The outcome is time and knowledge sensitive. So if you are able to pick up and identify, admit the child, start treatment immediately, you can reduce mortality to zero. So your knowledge is going to save your patients. So with that, once again, I'd like to thank you all for the patient hearing. My appreciation to IMA Tamil Nadu and also CGP Tamil Nadu for taking this initiative. Those who want the slides, please note down my number. My number is 98422. 98422-1179. You can send a personal request to me. I'll send you the slides. 98422-111-1179. So I'm going for a physical meeting now. So if there are any questions, you can ask me. You can unmute and ask me. Or you can put it in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Mohan Kumar, who is uh, the coordinator of the show, who is one of the organizing members of the Infection Disease Certificate course. Friends, we have got a IMA CGP Infection Disease Certificate course, a six months course with Tamil Nadu Medical Council credit hours of 10 hours. Uh, the first co uh, three courses are over, third course is running. If you are interested, uh, you can join the next course. So be, keep yourself aware. You can uh, contact the CGP office in Chennai or you can contact CGP president and secretaries. You can join the course, the fourth course. So on behalf of our infection disease certificate course, Dr. Farmer, D DPH, Director of Public Health, Dr. Kulainde Sami, Dr. Raghunandan, Dr. Mohan Kumar, infection disease consultant, epidemiologist, CDC, and uh, Dr. Suri Kumar, Microbiology Head of the Department, Medical College, Dindical. I, I, I wish you all a happy learning and thank you for giving this opportunity. At present, we don't have any vaccine for dengue. It's a pro we are doing a phase three trial. Probably in years to come, we'll be getting a very, very good vaccine. Already we got a vaccine in, for malaria. Soon we'll be getting a vaccine for dengue also. Unfortunately, we had it. Okay. 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 Yeah.
கண்டுபிடிச்சா 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 மே கோஸ்ட் பண்ணிட்டாங்க ரகுநந்தன் சார் ஆல்ரெடி இருக்காரு சரி சுரேஷ் சந்தர்னா சுரேஷ் பண்ணிருங்க நீங்க ஆயிட்டீங்களா ஹோஸ்ட் ஆயிட்டீங்களா அவரே தான் அவரே தான் இந்த சேட் பாக்ஸ் Enason cartus is positive i i told you enason by cartus is a, a less reliable test because 33% false negativity and and 33% false positivity even in other dengue like viruses be positive so it's not a reliable test by cartus so do not do cartus that's a recommendation by the government of india and also by who never rely upon cartus it's either clinical or after end of fifth day you go by ns1 uh, igm igg by elisa or if you want to do it earlier you do it by elisa method not by cartus cartus is not advised by the government of india dexo should not be used in dengue because as i told you already there is a leak from the intravascular compartment to the extravascular compartment that be dehydration and you have to give isotonic fluid which is normal saline to get back the fluids increase the intravascular compartment if you use dexo containing fluid you will land up in neuroendocrine stress phenomenon you will have a cerebral edema seizures you will develop invite complications rather than getting cured never use dextros dengue reinfection can be possible there are four types of dengue or dengue type 1 2 3 4 because if you get type 1 for the first time second time you can get it type 2 because uh, the antibodies against type 1 will not give cross protection against type 2 unfortunately these antibodies are called disease enhancing antibodies sometimes when they get type 1 when they get type 2 for the second time the disease will be severity will be nearly 200 fold high that's why in secondary dengue the complications are more so if you are getting the, for the second time the complication is more in our experience if you can get the dengue third time or the fourth time the complications are less tertiary dengue quartary dengue complications are less so secondary dengue you have to be very very cautious how can you identify the child is sick having danger signs whether it is primary or dengue do not worry admit the child treat as per who protocol short on normal saline that's a important thing after fifth day if you do igg and igm when igg is strongly positive with igm positive or negative probably you are dealing with secondary dengue so when igg is strongly positive you are dealing with secondary dengue that be very very careful so as per who uh, guidelines there is no role for any drugs to improve platelet count or any any role for other kashayams and other things because this is going to be evidence based protocol as per who they do not have any role in the management of dengue sometimes we do see lots of children having two diseases in given child sometimes we do, we do see dengue with typhoid dengue with typhus dengue with malaria dengue with lepto dengue with three diseases last time we had one child from uh, uh, arunachal pradesh who has uh, who, ha- who happened to travel from t- to tamil nadu to okina mill his son had th- dengue he had dengue malaria and also he had typhoid so culture positive typhoid igm igg by elisa dengue strongly positive and also he has had ps peripheral smear study positive for malaria so in that case you have to treat all the three at the given time mortality is very high when there is a comorbid illness if the fever is beyond 11 days if the child has got hepatosplenomegaly in dengue usually you get only hepatomegaly if you got hepatosplenomegaly and if there is a leukocytosis uh, if there is a, a lymphadenopathy all these things are in favor of uh, two diseases or thing beyond dengue 
So now I request, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I request the next speaker, Dr. Rahunandan, to talk about uh, script typhus and typhoid. And I also, after him, I request Dr. Suresh Kumar to talk about flu and uh, leptospirosis. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Sorry, I could not. Thank you very much. Ramanandan, sir, you can start sharing your slides, sir. Sandil, you can make Raghunandan sir as co-host. Hema Raghun Nirpanga. Have I left any questions? You can give Parsamal once in six hours. You cannot give Parsamal once in four hours. If there is a fever in between, you have to monitor them. And then you have to wait and give Parsamal only once in six hours. Ravnandan, sir, you can start sharing your slides. Secondary dengue is a time when you get dengue for the second time. So when you get dengue for the second time, it's secondary dengue. Many a times, first time dengue, parents do not notice. Because if you look at the history of dengue, many children, they will have uh, dengue, but they will go to the hospital for minor skin rash or a a headache or a cough or a cold or a diarrhea. That's called undifferentiated dengue. Neither the doctor nor the patient uh, know that the patient has got dengue. So many a time primary dengue goes unnoticed and they will be coming to you as dengue. Uh, but that will be a secondary dengue. You have to keep that in the back of the mind. Capillary refill time is lift the hand above the heart level or lift the feet above the heart level, press it for a few seconds and then release it. And then the capillary that is blanched has to become pink within a matter of three seconds. That's normal. If it is beyond three seconds, say seven seconds or eight seconds, 10 seconds, the child has got prolonged capillary refill time. The child is going for shock. You need to admit them. So that's very, very important. Raghunandan, sir, you can share, share your slides. There is no role for doxycycline in dengue. Please remember, do not give doxycycline, misuse the antibiotic. It is given for scriptifus. Sometimes if you know the patient has got scriptifus and dox, under dengue, you can use that doxycycline. Otherwise, do not give. Sometimes as per theoretically, this doxycycline has got a... Uh, 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 effect particularly in neutralizing IL-6 human necrosing factors. If the child patient is going for uh, uh, cytokine storm, you can use doxycycline, but that, there is no definite role for that. It's a theoretical, but definitely when you think two infections like scrub and dengue, you can use doxycycline. The dose of doxycycline is four to five milligram per kg once a day. Tourniquet test is uh, apply a tourniquet about one third of the size of the arm. That is, uh, it should be one third covering one third of the length of the arm and then apply it firmly and first uh, rise the BP to systolic and uh, then gradually reduce it. Uh, you have to see. Uh, one square inch below the uh, uh, volar surface of the forearm. Gradually reduce from systolic just uh, above the diastolic and keep it for two minutes and then gradually release and uh, slowly reduce it. Then after one minute, you see the one square inch. It's not one square centimeter. If there are more than 10 petty K, then it's tonic test is positive. The sensitivity specificity is 
very good more than 95% if it is done above the second beyond the second day of fever that is whenever there is a capillary fragility whenever there is a leak you can have this tonicot test positive during dengue monsoon when tonicot test is positive invariably you can say it is a clinical dengue Ragunandan sir, you can yes, sir. share your slide, sir. Please go ahead. Is it visible, sir? Yes, sir. Your slides are visible, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, can I start the presentation? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> uh, good morning, all. First of all, I thank uh, all the office bearers of the uh, state branch of uh, Tamil Nadu of IMA and also the uh, national branch for uh, arranging this uh, relevant or important CME program. As Dr. Neminathan has rightly said, now the monsoon has started and in the next two, three months, we are going to face uh, acute febrile illness as one of the common clinical problems that we are going to manage in our practice. So all the six topics of are very, very relevant on today's context. So Dr. Nebinathan has, has already started the ball rolling with the two important problem of Nipah. Even though uh, in our state, it's not a major issue, but we have to be very, very vigilant, especially across the districts in uh, liaison with the Kerala. And of course, Dengue is a, a very, very important critical topic for understanding. So I'll be very happy to take up some more questions on dengue also since Sad is leaving for another meeting. As far as adult management is concerned, if the participants have any questions, we can discuss in the end of this my talk. So my talk today is going to be on two important topics. One on the scrub typhus and other on the age-old uh, typhoid fever. In fact, I would like to call it as a enteric fever for a simple reason which I will tell you. Later. <clears throat> so, whenever when you are handling a fever or an infectious disease, it could be an organ based infection or, for example, respiratory tract infection or a urinary tract infection or a gastrointestinal infection. It could be an organ based infection or we call it as an acute undifferentiated febrile illness, like AUFA, acute undifferentiated febrile illness under which they classify into malaria and non-malarial components. So therefore, all the diseases today we are going to discuss on the non-malarial acute undifferentiated febrile illness of which now first we'll go to scrub typhus. So my talk includes <clears throat> very interesting etiological aspects and epidemiological aspects. And for any diseases to be managed effectively, we should understand the natural history of the disease, including its pathogenesis, of course, the clinical manifestations and laboratory, and how to confirm our clinical suspicion based on clinical as well as on laboratory, and other close differential diagnosis, and finally, on treatment and prevention. In fact, all the diseases, for example, dengue, your um, scrub typhus, leptospirosis, malaria, and typhoid, they are all overlapping syndromes. I would say it's an overlapping syndrome. That is where the clinical examination every day and proper history is going to be a very important factor in our clinical diagnosis. Coming back to our topic of today is on the scrub. It's a rickettsia. These are the very, very small. When we are reading microbiology, we never showed so much interest on these diseases, but off late, it has, especially in our Tamil Nadu, uh, districts like um, Chennai, Vellur, Kishnagiri, Dharmaburi, these are the few, especially Kishnagiri and Darbaburi, they have got the maximum prevalence of this scrub typhus. And in today's world of traveling uh, so fast, it doesn't matter whether he is from a particular district because the travel has become a very common phenomenon. So coming back to our thing, it is also known as a chigar bone typhus. It is transmitted by a mite. So it's a vector bone. It's a vector bone diseases. It is transmitted by a small mite which uh, we call it as chiggers. So humans, they get infected when they are bitten by these uh, chiggers. The mites or the chiggers, they feed on the serum of warm-blooded animals only, once only in their life, 
in the larval stage, the adults feed on the plant juices. In fact, this disease dates back to 1944 when US Army, uh, where people were more affected and they have lost half of their urine. Since then, it has been a very interesting disease. And um, even the soldiers used to call it as a, a Shishisto fever or Artsgua fever. So uh, at last it was identified. The, the bug was identified in Japanese in 1930 by O Sutskamushi. That's why it is also the parasite is named under him. It is an intracellular gram positive. Uh, the disease is called scrub. Why it is called a scrub typhus? Because it generally occurs after exposure to areas with scrub vegetations, because this is where these rodents predominantly live. It can be also prevalent in areas like sandy beaches, mountain deserts, and forest. So it is, as I said, it is uh, commonly found in our Southeast Asian countries, especially in India and Southern India. So this is called as an interesting triangle, North, South and West uh, triangle. And these are the areas of uh, areas where scrub typhus were found to be on high violence. Again, in India, as I said, it is uh, prevalent for quite some time. And especially in Tamil Nadu, I already mentioned the districts uh, where it is already highly prevalent. The mortality ranges from 1 to 60 percent depending on the early diagnosis. It's a very interesting disease where it can involve multi-system involvement. So when we go to the clinical features, we'll try to highlight more on that. And all races and both men and affected, again, all age groups are equally affected. So this particular slide tells you the vector and the causative agent. Um, it, even though it looks like a bed bug, something like that, but in practically it is not visible to our eyes. So if you look into this life cycle, this is where the, this larva, this larva, they try to have a blood from the rodents, but incidentally man becomes a uh, accidental host. That is how the people who are exposed to these kind of uh, uh, soily regions or scrubs areas, this larva might bite the humans and humans become the accidental host. Because why this is clinically important is the clinical, the characteristic clinical feature, what we sell as a eshkar, is the point on which this larva enters the human body. So this is the life cycle. And again, as I said, man is the accidental host. Otherwise, normally they bite the rodents. So again, the, all the uh, seasons I mentioned, but today, with changing climate, no month is exempted for any particular cases. Yes. Coming back to our most important component of this talk is Eshkar. What is this Eshkar? This is, a, as I already told, it is a point where the, it enters the, or the, the bug enters the human body. Again, the, what are the risk factors? I already explained to you. It's usually occupational or it could be agricultural exposure like oil, palm, rubber plantation, rice fields, and also during travel activities such as uh, rafting and camping also it can occur. Again, military, we already saw in the US thing, it has affects some military personnel. Again, it can be a trans, uh, it can be vertical transmissions. It can occur in the form of from mother to neonate can also is possible. Again, this particular slide is important to understand the pathogenesis of this particular infection. So what I do, if you follow this uh, flow chart, it inoculation, as I said, the place where this uh, uh, bug uh, bites something, it becomes a car. Then they go into the regional lymph node enlargement. So it, one of the clinical features that we clinically look for is the enlarged lymph nodes. Again, it gets into a so spread by bloodstream. So we could involve multi-system, which we are going to learn later. And it can invade the vascular endothelium and it can cause uh, general organ hyperemia, hyperemia and generalized lymphadenopathy also. So um, as uh, Dr. Naminathan said, was repeatedly telling about the duration of illness of a uh, dengue, usually it is around 10 to 12 days. But when it comes to scrub typhus or the next disease which you're going to learn on enteric fever, they are fevers of more than two or three weeks. Before. In fact, uh, if you look into the natural history of uh, scrub typhus, it involves around 
two to three weeks in duration. Why this is important is that is where earlier, yeah, if you are failing to pick up a, or suspect a case of scrub typhus, the patients may move from one doctor to another doctor and later you may develop complications. So that is where uh, follow-up of each patient, even that our patients come to us as outpatient department for acute fibrillar illness, uh, it's always that we have to follow up the patient and also make sure that relevant investigations are done at the appropriate time. So these both are important, what investigation and what duration of illness. For example, there's a lot of discussion on NS1 antigen, IgM and IgG for dengue. So like that, for this also, let us look at what investigations and again, for typhoid also, we are going to look. Yes, now we're coming into the events what can occur in the first week. The inoculation occurs through the bite of the chigger and it is often painless and again, it is unnoticed. The incubation period for this particular uh, rickettsia is around 6 to 20 days, average of 10 days. So the most characteristic thing that what we look for is a small painless papule initially appears at the site of infection and enlarges gradually. The central area of necrosis develops and is followed by a, a scar. Normally, say, we have a burning cigarette. For burning cigarette, wound or ulcers form out though, it is something like that. But the most interesting, this very, very important clinical point, is it easily picked up in our practice? No, because this particular chigar bites at places where it is very moisty. For example, in humans, they say, these chigars, they normally bite in the axilla, in the groin, in the external genitalia, or under the breast tissue like that. Why this is important is normally these sites in our busy practice, we never look or sometimes even patient themselves may not have a look at this uh, eshkas because they are appearing at a very, very unusual sites. And again, uh, they appear only in around 30 to 50 percent of patients and we have to uh, look for it. And again, pathognomonic uh, eshkar can be picked up. Otherwise, it may be easily missed. And it is, as I said, it is like a black necrotic lesion resembling a cigarette burn, where I already mentioned moist areas and wrinkled, wrinkled and covered by the tight clothing areas. So this is one of the common classical picture of a Eshka. It is an occurs as an epidermal ulcer covered by a black crust surrounded by an erythematous halo. So this is another one. Again, this is another on the side of the abdomen. Again, this is again Yashkas, they can occur at a very, very atypical sites. Uh, again, in our practice, we have picked up all these sites. That is why I was mentioning about proper clinical examination from head to foot on every day. Suppose he comes today and again he comes back after two days. Again, you start examining him as if you are examining him for the first time. So this you can see on the external genitalia, thigh, all these regions you have seen where it can appear. Oh, again, the biopsy shows uh, perivascular infiltrates with mostly consists of lymphocytes and macrophages. Okay, what are the other differential diagnoses that we can think when you see a ESCAR could be a cutaneous uh, anthrax or a tuleremia or LGV or a cat spread sickness. Okay, now, as I already said, the most pathognomonic sign is the ESCAR. But unfortunately, it may not be there in every patient. Around 30 to 40 percent only, it is there. So it consists of regional lymphadenopathy. Apart from the thing, it can occur at the end of first week. It is raining the regional where the eshkar has occurred, and it is a tenderless enlargement there. And it may result later. Apart from regional, then patient can develop generalized lymphadenopathy where it can mimic like a lymphoma also. Patients uh, coming to other most important feature is the abrupt onset of high fever like 104, headache, malaise, myalgia approximately after the 10 day of infection. So this is where it mimics like a dengue syndrome also. Again, other, again when the fever appears, the eshkar is well formed and fever is the most important presenting symptom of scrub typhus. And apart from that, it can Mimic, it can develop maculopapular rashes also, which appear on the chest, abdomen, whole trunk like that. 
again, it may be transient and it can be missed. So just if you look at this slide of frequency of symptoms, already I mentioned fever is the most common symptom, sudden onset of high fever, presence of Eshkar, lymphadenopathy. Again, the other complications that can occur is the ARDS like picture. So they can develop cough, chills, rash, headache, and diarrhea. So the, this is a classical presentation of a acute febrile illness during the first week of illness. This is mimics like a dengue fever also. So if the, if the, if the patient, the clinical findings doesn't make a clinical diagnosis or if the diagnosis is not thought or confirmed, the patient slips into a second week where he can go for complications. As I said, it is a multi-system disease so it can involve most of our major systems. So we'll try to understand the clinical features of heat system. One, central nervous system. They can develop tremors, nervousness, learning of speech, and acute deafness. This is another very interesting clinical feature, acute deafness with short fever, think possibility of the scrum. And again, it can cause seizures and very rarely coma and uh, unconsciousness. Next, we'll go to the characteristic uh, problem. For example, when we talk of dengue resulting in hemorrhage shock syndrome, when we talk of uh, scrub typhus, it mainly involves a respiratory system producing ARDS-like picture. In fact, in our uh, Ajay Gandhi Government General Hospital, we have treated hundreds of cases of ARDS, and many times they think of um, something septicemia or some other uh, problem, but it turned out to be, many times it turned out to be a simple uh, scrub typhus resulting in ARDS. Why I am mentioning the clinical suspicion of scrub is important because once you give doxycycline or once you give azithromycin, this is one of the very good disease to see the clinical improvement occurring so fast. We have seen a severe ARDS admitted with ventilator and all. Once a diagnosis is made and patient is put on appropriate uh, antibiotic, the patient recovers so fast, they can even walk out of IMCU in two to three days. So that is where clinical suspicion of ARDS due to scrub is very, very important because it's a very good disease to treat. So when it involves, it can develop a cough, tachypnea, pulmonary infiltrates and ARDS. And again, cardiac involvement, it can cause myocarditis, cardiac failure. Again, this relative bradycardia, again, we are going to learn in typhoid also where, uh, for example, normally for every one degree of uh, rise of temperature, we expect the pulse rate to increase by 10, but that they don't occur in some fevers. Again, one such is um, script typhus. Again, they can go for acute kidney injury, shock, and disseminated intravascular coagulations. So all these fevers, for example, dengue or malaria or a scrub or lepto, all these things are known to cause multi-system involvement, but each disease, for example, lepto has more of a renal complications are more commonly we come across. Similarly, for dengue shock syndrome, for scrub, it is ARDS. So now after, so just to recollect the clinical features, acute onset of high fever, with lymphadenopathy, with they can have uh, myalgia, they can have cough, and most important complications will be a respiratory system in the form of ARDS or cardiac complications in the form of myocarditis or kidney injury. So it's a disease of two to three weeks. So we have to confirm the diagnosis. Again, they have a leukopenia with lymphopenia, with late lymphocytosis, Again, thrombocytopenia, again, all this leukopenia, all these things can mimic like a dengue-like picture. But again, we have elevated of liver enzymes. 70 to 90 percent, they have a transaminitis is there. Hypoalbuminemia can occur. Hyperbilodemia is rare. That is why whenever when you are thinking of acute febrile illness with uh, elevated bilirubin and elevated, think of a, for example, even in dengue, Transaminitis is very common, but you don't see the bilirubin uh, rising. So when you start uh, seeing bilirubin increasing with dengue-like picture or a scrub-like picture, we have to think of other infections, especially leptospirosis or a viral hepatitis, where the bilirubin will be increasing. Again, 
somebody was talking about co-infection. Again, in a tropical country like ours, please remember, even in Dengue, they say 30 to 40 percent, 30 to 40 percent of Dengue patients are having more than one infection. That it's a very, very important clinical point. Again, Dr. Neminathan has stressed, we have seen two in one or even three in one, like uh, dengue, scrub, and uh, malaria together, lepto, like that. So any combination we have seen. Again, the most specific test for the diagnosis of our uh, uh, scrub typhus is your wheel felix reaction. Again, wheel felix reaction is uh, trying to direct the antibody titer. So if any test that going to direct the antibody titer, please do it after seven days. Because the early titer may not be significant. And again, the basic thumb rule is rise in titer. So the rise in titer, again, more than four times is a very, very characteristic feature of a um, Neil Felix reaction. Again, apart from that, we can have other uh, immunofluorescent uh, uh, assay can be done. Again, cultures, even though it's not a very common, can be done. Again, uh, IgM and other things for uh, IgG for the acute infection and chronic infection for scrub can be done. But most commonly we do is see B. Felix reaction. <clears throat> so the cultures, they are not routinely done. And then epidemiological data to confirm, as I said, uh, in few districts are bushy, visit to the bushy areas, all these trekking, all these things or sandy areas, they can give a clue. Again, clinical examination of ESCA, regional lymphadenopathy, fever, rash, leukopenia is a very, very common uh, clinical features and confirmed by Beat Felix reaction. Now coming to the specific treatment. Again, as I said, it's a very good disease to treat. So uh, before going to specific treatment, uh, make the patient have a good bed rest, adequate fluid, make sure that hydration is ensured and good nursing care. And as far as drugs are concerned, we are having two or three drugs, which is very, very simple, easily available, less side effect. One is the tetracycline or a doxycycline. So it can be given for a seven days antibiotic is choice. We give 100 to 200 milligrams once daily. Uh, only problem with doxy, it cannot be given in a pregnant women and in children less than seven, eight years, where we do try azithromycin. Again, azithromycin is a macrolid, which is having very promising results, even for our enteric fear, which we are going to learn in the next talk. Apart from that, Irfambicin has also been tried. So my simple suggestion would be in our practice is, if the patient is having fever, lymphadenopathy with ESCAR, straight away the diagnosis, clinical diagnosis is confirmed and we can start with doxy or azithromycin. And maybe if you want to confirm, we can do the weed felix reaction. Because the early starting of treatment definitely arrest the progression of symptoms like ARDS and other cardiac and neurological complications. And definitely we can prevent the morbidity and mortality as far as scrub is concerned. So as I already mentioned about the dose, pain for uh, other uh, doxoromycin has also, also been tried. As far as azithro is concerned, 500 milligrams for three days is enough. So, 88 become afibrillin and all clinical symptoms disappear within 72 hours of treatment. So as far as prevention, as I said, rat is the regular host for this uh, uh, tromoculant bite to bite. So avoid all these places where they can be there. So somebody was asking for dengue vaccine. So like that, there's no effective vaccine against scrub typhus. But when you look into it, why it is not very, because for vaccine to develop, uh, it should have a utility of uh, uh, major things. But here, uh, it gives protection only to the particular strain locally. That's what uh, the literature says. That is why a vaccine developed for one locality may not be protective in another. This complexity continues to hamper the efforts to produce a viable vaccine. So I think uh, the points to remember, Scrub is caught by an orientus with skomushi. They acquire the infection because of the bitten by the larva of tuberculin mite. The features are fever, eshka, regional lymphadenopathy, rash, and leukopenia. And uh, they respond to macrolates and tetracycline. So, this is the first part of my talk today. Um, any questions? Can I take it now?
Sir, can I go to the next presentation? Hello? Hello? Am I audible, sir? Sir, you are audible. You can proceed, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. So we'll go to the next uh, part of my second part of my talk that is on enteric fever. <clears throat> I think this is a age old fever which we have been uh, treating in our country for uh, many, many years, but still it's going to going to be a challenge for many reasons. Again, I, I am avoiding the word typhoid fever because uh, now when we say typhoid, it should also include the other uh, uh, zero zero wars like your para typhoid A B and C. So the better term in my talk would be our enteric fever. So we'll just go by the outline of this uh, my talk, which includes definition, sources of infection, agent, and the incubation time. Again, pathogenesis, clinical features, diagnosis, treatment, complications, and prevention. Why I say this a uh, it's an interesting disease to manage, even though we have been managing for many years is. Still, it's a, all of us know it's a, a disease, uh, fecal oral route and hygiene and water, food hygiene still has its own uh, issues in our country. And also use of antibiotics and uh, uh, resistant, antimicrobial resistance is another important area where uh, it's a, going to be a challenge. And number three, even though vaccines are available for typhoid, still its utility is not satisfactory. So these are the few challenges. So that is why still enteric fever is a disease to be managed in our day-to-day -day practice. So before I go to the presentation, uh, let me uh, completely uh, define the three important terms as far as the typhoid is concerned. One, we call it as a confirmed enteric fever, probable enteric fever, and chronic, chronic, chronic carrier stage. So when what we mean by confirmed enteric fever is fever of more than 38 degrees C, degrees Celsius for at least three days with a laboratory confirmed positive culture. So when we say laboratory confirmed positive culture, usually we do blood, but as we go later, I'll also tell you what are the other things that can be cultured, including bone marrow or the bowel fluid of salmonella typhoid. At this moment, I am. I want to express my personal opinion. In our day-to-day -day practice, is it possible? Is it really possible to do a blood culture for all our acute febrile illness? Maybe in the end of my discussion, the participants can give their feedback because it may not be possible in every situation of a acute febrile illness when you're suspecting typhoid to go for a blood culture. And also use of antibiotics before patients coming to us is another problem. One second, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, one second. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Okay. <clears throat> uh, okay. Um, so we are we are talking about three important definitions. Sorry that slides were not visible. So we are talking about confirmed enteric fever. So as I said, to get a blood culture in every patient, it's going to be a difficult task that we will take. But definition says when you say confirmed, it should be culture positive. Or it could be a probable enteric fever where fever of more than three days duration with positive zero diagnosis or deduction of an antigen test, but without that is, you are doing a antibody titer in the form of vital test with rise in titer. It can be taken as a probable. And again, another interesting this, this another interesting point that we have to understand as far as our typhoid is concerned is the carrier state. Again, 
the most interesting the typhoid salmonella typhoid bacillus humans are the only host and reservoirs for salmonella typhoid humans are the only host and reservoirs so many of the still typhoid fever outbreaks that can occur are only because of the human transmission human to human and also all of us remember the typhoid mary when we read reading about the thing in new york restaurant around 50 people were infected by a uh, food handler in that case so we have to be very careful even in our private practice as far as food handlers are concerned they must be routinely screened for this particular carrier stay so what does the definition say excretion of salmonella typhoid in stools or urine in the form of repetitive positive bile or duodenal string cultures for longer than one year after the onset of acute enteric fever so at this moment i will just try to uh, define the carrier state further also we classify carrier state of typhoid into three types we one is convalescent that is convalescent means 3 weeks to 3 months after recovery of the uh, typhoid fever the person continues to excrete this uh, bacteria in the stool so it is called convalescent 3 weeks to 3 months when it continues up to 3 years that is from 3 months to 1 year it is called temporary carrier then according to this chronic carrier means they are carry for more than 1 year because they are the potential sources for infection and outbreaks in the especially in hostels or in hotels like that so whether they can be picked up yes they can be picked up from the culture what just now i mentioned and we have one more tool what we call it as v1 virulence antibody test is of value when you are screening for this carrier so it's a blood test the presence of v1 virulence carrier antibody can be used as a screening tool okay so well, as i said humans are the only natural host and most so most common sources are food or water contaminated with feces again or fruits and raw fruits and vegetables contaminated with sewage water again the most common another common thing is your cold items like your ice cream so these are the common sources for the getting infected because of typhoid bacillus as i said corns are salmonella enterica is a broad species with multiple zero wars are there one of them is salmonella typhoid again we have salmonella para typhi a that is the most common in the world again in india also it is most common we have a salmonella para typhi b which is more found in europe again para typhi c it's a rare of the three again it's found in far east countries again incubation is around 5 to 15 days this is very important what happens once a bacteria enters a gi tract what happens next again the acid the acid in the stomach doesn't really protect that is why even in normal people it can bypass the stomach and enter the ileum and small intestine and especially in people who are having a aclo idea today as a very important clinical point we are using this pantoprazole omeprazole all these proton pump inhibitors for various reasons so all this will suppress the acid again that facilitates the Um, infection due to typhoid so that also we have to keep it in mind so after ingestion they penetrate the mucus mucus that is the characteristic part of the intestine that it picks up is the payer's patch so they pick up the payer's patch of the small intestine and it is there phagocytis phagocytosed by the macrophages then it disseminates throughout the body it affects most of our body through the lymphatics and they colonize in the reticular endothelial system of liver spleen lymph node and bone marrow so this is what happens during the incubation period just now we saw the incubation period is around 5 to 15 days so after ingestion this process occurs in our body again at this moment i try to differentiate because typhoid also causes ulcers in the gi tract our tuberculosis also causes ulcers in the gi tract but the way it causes is different it produces uh, uh, horizontal or vertical ulcer pas patch are more of vertical so it causes the salmonella typhi pick up picks up pas patches so it produces oval ulcers and bleeding and perforation tuberculosis ulcers will call strictures circumferential ulcers 
and it will cause more of intestinal obstruction and strictures. So this is how both the, both the TB and typhoid affects the intestines, but the mode is different. Okay, now we'll come to clinical presentations. So again, the fever is the most common symptoms. Again, in fact, uh, typhoid fever, they say it can go up to even four weeks of illness. So what happens during every week, we try to understand it quickly. So it exhibits, I think the uh, um, time old classical description is we call it as a step ladder pattern. So what we mean by step ladder, the temperature rises over the course of each day and drops by subsequent morning. Uh, again, Peaks up there. Next slide, you can see it is like a like the glitches peak comes down again. Next day, it goes up again. So, like that, every day the peak goes up starting from around 37, 38 to 40, 41. So, this is a classical uh, presentation of a stepladder fever of a typhoid or enteric fever. Next common presentation is the diffuse abdominal pain and tenderness. Sometimes it's a colicky, mainly in the right. Upper cord. Again, as I mentioned about infiltration in the payers patches, causing inflammation and narrowing. Again, it's another interesting thing is we normally say vomiting, diarrhea, especially in children, but they say in adults, constipation is, can also occur. Then other non-specific symptoms like dry cough, dull frontal headache, delirium. It's a very, very important. In fact, the word typhoid itself, it means delirium. So one of the common differential diagnoses in our busy practice is fever with delirium. Of course, we think of malaria, typhoid also, apart from other meningoencephalitis. But one of the common, uh, what is uh, delirium is uh, uh, clouding of consciousness. So stupor, again, I'm showing some other uh, study which showed the common uh, neurological manifestations of typhoid. We'll again come back in the later slides. So they can have a delirium. So acute fever with delirium, one of the first differential diagnoses is typhoid and malaria. <clears throat> so what happens during the second week? So above symptoms and signs, they progress. And even though we read rose spots, I think in a dark skin people like Indians, it's very, maybe the audience can uh, say whether they have picked up this thing. But anyway, the textbooks do mention about these rose spots. But uh, interestingly, it's a very important point because we can take biopsy from these rose spots. I was mentioning about biopsy, sorry, uh, cultures. So one of the things we do normally is blood culture and uh, uh, bone marrow culture like that. They say the, you can take a culture because that represents the bacterial emboli to the dermis. So what is it? It's a solvent colored blanching macropapules of occurring in the chest and abdomen around one to four centimeters in length. So you can see all this. But um, to be very frank, I have not seen uh, in my practice. So they can go for abdominal distension. Again, soft as compared to malaria where you get a foam spring. Again, I was mentioning about uh, relative bradycardia. So as I said, they can have a, um, for example, temperature of one or two, that uh, pulse rate may be only around 80. And another interesting clinical finding is your dichrotic pulse. What is dichrotic pulse is double beat. The second beat is alternating with strong and weak beat. So these are the few important things that we can, the, one of the relative radicals is easily picked up in our practice. Then what happens during the third week, the fever may persist. The complications really at the end of second and beginning of third week is the complication problem. So they can develop increase in toxemia, weight loss, conjunctivitis. They can go for uh, severe abdominal distension, pneumonitis like pictures, ready pulse, all these things can occur. And they can develop a, even a foul green colored diarrhea. They call it as a peep soup diarrhea. And again, psychosis, confusion, psychosis, perforation, peritonitis. Again, death may occur due to severe toxemia, myocarditis, or intestinal bleed. And then during the fourth week, improvement may occur. Abdominal distension may progress. Untreated suffer from all the complications just now I mentioned. 
so another important thing asymptomatic so many of the many of the 10 to 20 percent of the people can without developing any fever or other symptoms of enteric fever they can continue to be a asymptomatic carrier and they could be a sources of infection okay now coming to the investigation how to confirm our clinical suspicion so this is a good slide telling what test to be done during which week of the illness so commonly what we do is a complete hemogram. So one, I'm, I'm going to give you some simple tips on which you can make a diagnosis without even waiting for your blood culture. We already discussed about step ladder fever, delirium, uh, clouding of consciousness, uh, relative bradycardia, all these things, coated tongue, uh, epitosmenia, yes, especially during the first week you have epitomegaly. During the second week, you develop patient develops spleno, soft splenomegaly like that. So one test, uh, complete hemogram will show. Usually, it shows leukopenia and eosinopenia. That is very very characteristic feature of a typhoid. Eosinopenia is very important. Again, uh, we are talking about bread culture, and nowadays we are talking some new upcoming card tests and other things like typhoid dot typhoid dot m. Again, as far as viral, please do not do on first week because it will tell you only the baseline. Maybe the second week you can look for, or even if you do in the first week, rise in titer during the second or third week will be confirmatory for your uh, confirming the enteric fever. So still the gold standard is your blood culture. I'll give you some few important points for taking your blood culture. They say the amount of blood to be taken for a blood culture is directly proportional to the positivity. That means they say, in fact, you have to take around 20 to 30 ml of blood, even though it's a very difficult thing, but that's what the guideline is telling. More the quantity, better the uh, being positive. Number one, again, before the onset of starting the antibiotic, which is a very difficult thing in our practice. Most of our patients, they do take self uh, medications number 3 is sometimes you have to repeat today morning after 24 hours again after one week that's what they say three times also they have to be repeated and again importance of stool culture again it's so one advantage of stool culture is it can be positive even if the patient has taken antibiotics same thing for the bone marrow also so one of the area where you can do a culture for typhoid is bone marrow that will overcome the issues relating to your use of antibiotics. Of course, they, you can take the gastric aspirate from the bile also that can be used. So these are the important investigations. Still gold standard is culture or blood viral or your uh, uh, typhoid, typhoid dot and typhoid dot M uh, card based test. Again, you can look for ultrasound for epitosplenomegaly. Again, I mentioned about the various uh, uh, cultures that can be useful. Okay, coming to the once uh, diagnosis is confirmed, one of the important thing in treatment before I mention about the antibiotics, uh, one of the important thing in typhoid fever is taking care of hydration because it is a lot of to toxemias are there. Adequate fluid management is very, very important. Make sure diet. In, in fact, uh, those days, those senior doctors will remember. Those days, we used to have an enteric ward separately. For example, in uh, Madras Medical College, in second floor, we had a typhoid ward. Only the patients of typhoid were admitted. They were given a very soft diet and a good hygienic environment like that. So the diet is very important. Taking care of hydration is very important. Of course, the most important is appropriate antibiotics. Again, in our practice, we can manage around 80 to 90% of our patients can be managed as outpatient if the patient does not have any warning symptoms and signs, which I will discuss later. So coming to the antibiotic usage, so we can classify uh, enteric fever into uncomplicated and complicated enteric fever. Again, in uncomplicated uh, fever, whether they are responding to quinolones or quinolone resistance. Because all of us, those days, we remember, we started with chlorophenicol. Uh, for more than 100 years, we have been using that. But off late, you know, we are even using co-trimoxazole like that. But then we switched over to quinolones. 
And I'm sure even today's context, ciprofloxacin resistance is also a challenge. But if it is sensitive, still phenolones are the drugs of choice. For want of time, I'm not going to the individual dosages. You can just see it on the screen. So it's a good drug. Phenolones are a good drug to start with for 10 days. And again, if you are feeling quinolones are resistance, so that is where the cephalosporins comes into picture. So one of the common drugs we use is cefexan, 20 milligrams per kg body weight for two weeks. Again, another very interesting drug we are mentioning about azithromycin for uh, scar typhus. So today, concerns, again, in today's context, azithromycin is also strongly recommended, especially when you're suspecting a quinolone resistance uh, thing. Azithromycin, 10 to 20 milligram for uh, per kg body weight for seven days. So these are the two drugs that we are commonly using. If the patient is having a complicated enteric fever with complication, toxemia like that, third generation kephalosporins like cefotoxin or cefotoxamine can be used. Again, the appropriate dosage is given there. And again, we have to continue parentally for around two, two weeks in time. So the grossly, we can classify quinolone resistant or quinolone sensitive. Again, the two group of drugs is the cephalosporins and the macrolate antibiotics. So these are the three, four group of drugs at present available. And based on the local experience and the sensitivity of the issues, we can uh, use all these particular drugs. Again, the duration is around 10 to 14 days is the duration. Again, some other interesting feature is as far as uh, uh, carrier state is concerned, they say if you want to kick out the carrier state and treat the completely the carrier state of a people who are positive for this state. The WHO protocol tells 750 milligrams of ciprofloxacin twice daily, twice daily for four months. For four months, that's what the guideline is uh, telling for the carrier state. So now we'll try to end with some red flag symptoms because this is where Early referral from our private primary care to your secondary care or tertiary care is very, very critical. So that let us understand the red flag symptoms. For example, headache, vomiting, seizures, altered state of consciousness and papilledema. Again, cardiovascular, it can cause endocarditis, myocarditis with changing murmurs. Respiratory thing, it can cause lobar pneumonia like picture. Again, musculoskeletal rigidity, and swelling pain of joints and arthritis. Gastrointestinal, it can cause hepatitis. Genitourinary system, it can cause dysuria frequency. All these things are common. So, in fact, uh, uh, when we teach our undergraduate students, if you want to write the complications of uh, uh, typhoid, you can put all ITs from all the major organs. That thing Again, it can cause even a Soas abscess, gluteal abscess in very unusual situations and hemophagocytosis syndrome like this. So these are the various complications where which once you pick up better to admit and manage in a tertiary care hospitals. So you can see the various uh, neurological things that can occur. As I said, the word typhoid itself is mean clouding of consciousness. You can see the delirium is the most common. It can have an encephalitis, psychiatric. We have seen cerebellar symptoms. Mimics like meningitis, neuropathies are very uncommon, but important. So restlessness, confusion, incoherent speech, disorientation, and carphology are the important uh, common neuropsychiatric manifestations. So again, coming to one of the deadly complications of enteric fever is the perforation and bleed. And GI bleed and perforation. When to suspect enteric perforation? When the fever is continuing, severe abdominal Pain and the patient is having a leukocyte. As I said, the patient will have leukopenia in a classical enteric fever. The patient who had leukopenia continuing to show leukocytosis, continuing to see increase in pulse rate without uh, bleed. Again, think of a perforation. Again, they say chest infection also can be a clue for an enteric perforation. So coming back to the last part of my slide, as far as vaccines are concerned, again, surgical management includes uh, typhoid perforation closure, and also sometimes it can present as acute cholecystitis. So it can, in fact, the people with gallstone or um, uh, they are more prone for uh, uh, carrier state. 
and again chronic carrier state can be a risk factor for uh, carcinoma of the gallbladder that also they have been observed so sometimes the surgeons have some role to play when a patient uh, and we have a new vaccine also that has been introduced called as VITT, VITT conjugate vaccine. It is a fourth generation of vaccine. So it is an injectable vaccine. So it is given even from the month of uh, six months of age. Because here you can see it is uh, the various vaccinations. Um, one in the oral can be given only at a later age. And uh, this can be given from two years of age. Um, but as compared to this, the new vaccine can be given even from the six months of uh, age. So the old ones are under two years and six years. But this new vaccine, that is VATT conjugate vaccines, can be given from six months uh, up to 45 years of age. It's a 0.5 ml intramuscular and booster doses are given every three years. It's a very cost effective. But as I said, it has to be promoted, especially people coming from other countries who are visiting India. It can be our high risk group. Already I mentioned about high risk group, those with gallstones and other things. In fact, as far as enteric fever is concerned, the most common age is around 5 to 15 years. More than the adults, children are more prone for uh, infections. Again, in India, they observed even children less than 5 years are also at high risk of developing this enteric fever. So to summarize, 90% of our patients can be managed as outpatient. Stay alert, examine, review every day and look, exam from head to foot as if you are examining for the first time. Please identify the early identification of red flag symptoms. Avoid indiscriminate use of antibiotics. That is going to be a very big challenge and we have to be very conscious of this thing. Again, be aware of the awareness of food and water hygiene and identification and treatment of chronic carriers is going to be another important public health activity we have to keep it in mind and again vaccination of susceptible host thank you if there are any questions or any points we'll take it up thank you sir over to you sir sir Hello? Am I audible, sir? Am I audible? Hello? Okay, okay. About chat, chat, learn it, Okay, okay. So I request the audience to put their comments or questions in the chat box. Um, IgM, IgG for scrub. Yes, sir. It is available, but not freely available. The the basic concept of IgM and IgG is IgM shows the acute infection. IgG shows a chronic infection. For carriers, I said one would be a stool culture is ideal. Or as I said, we can go for the... Uh, BI antibody test, blood test. If they are not willing for vaccine, they can take up for the antibodies test of the blood. BI virulence antibody. This is called as BI virulence antibody test for screening for carrier state. Treatment of paratyphus is also similar to typhoid only, sir. Only thing that the main difference between typhoid and paratyphoid is paratyphoid is a little bit less. Um, I would say less severe in its manifestations. Uh, carrier state, I said uh, um, 
uh, ciprofloxacin, we have, it's a very costly treatment, very long-term treatment. We have to give uh, uh, antibiotic uh, of ciprofloxacin 750 milligrams twice daily for four months. Again, steroids, definitely it is not advisable in OP practice, sir. There are few only relative indications in a large, severe cerebral edema like that. Maybe Dr. Suresh, who's going to follow, can add in his experience of using steroids in typhoid. But personally, I not used anywhere. It will definitely aggravate bleeding and perforation. Is Vidal really useful? Yes, it can be useful, provided if you look for rise in titer. Suppose today the blood Vidal, again, there are two antigens, no O and H antigen. O is the first to rise. Suppose if it is 1 in 80, it becomes 1 in 160 or 1 in 320. Always the, any antibody titer, look for uh, rise of titers. Rise of titers correlating with clinical picture is always better. ESR, I don't think it has any, um, it's a more of acute infection. Interval between two titers, maybe five days, five to seven days. Yes, the quantity of blood is around, they say around 20 to 30 ml is needed. And preferably, preferably if the antibiotic it's not started before you start the antibiotic. Please take the blood for culture. I think all these slides can be shared later. I will uh, uh, coordinate with this thing. And there are some good articles on this that also I'll try to share. Stool culture or the antibody blood, blood antibodies is the auto identify carriers. Uh, it, it can be repeated, uh, it has to be repeated once in maybe two to three years. Why eosinopenia in typhoid? To be very frank, I don't know. Maybe Dr. Suresh can chip in doing his talk. Yes, I can. I can share the PPT slides, no problem. As I said, one in, one in 160, one in 320 can be considered as definitely a significant item. I think uh, let us, um, let us uh, make a clinical diagnosis first, which is very important. Again, when the, when the patient is not settling down, when there is a more than one infection, when you are suspecting all our investigations, sometimes the early treatment with the appropriate antibiotic based on history, good history and good clinical examination is the order of the day. And all these antibiotics, what we are mentioning, either your doxycycline or azithromycin or a suffixime or your... Uh, uh, third generations, I think they are freely available and uh, you should not sometimes wait for everything to be started. So I personally feel even uh, use of doxycycline in controlling the cytokine storm recently, many papers are also coming up. So these drugs, what we normally practice in our uh, primary care level, I feel it's a good drug, economically cheap also and not that much of side effects. So we can start quickly. C farers who are carriers for typhoid but asymptomatic, do they need, if they handle foods, eh, if they're handling food handlers, have to be definitely treated.
Okay, I think Dr. Uh, uh, Suresh is already joined. Uh, so I will just sign out, sir. Sir, I'm audible. Yeah, sir, you're audible, sir. You're audible. I think you can start. You can start your sharing. Is it possible? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are you are audible, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. You can start. Yes. Yeah, your slides are visible, sir. I hope my slides are uh, visible and I'm audible. Yeah, yeah. You are, okay. you are audible. You are audible and slides are visible. Instead of speaking, I'm not able to listen fully. Then. I'm able to see slides. I hope it is here yeah, audible as well as I'm, my slides are visible. If not visible or not audible, please please call and inform me that, or please call because message is very difficult to see at this point of time. Yeah. So Sir, I'm going am I to audible? speak about next two topics, leptospirosis and flu. What is there? Because we are before our lunch, I know. So I'll keep momentum going on. Before the disclosures, we deal with a lot of chicken pox, bird flu, swine flu, COVID, monkeypox, and everything. But don't think we are in veterinary doctors. We are in ID doctors. We do a lot of cultures and we react to the cultures in the sensitive way. So that is what we do. So we we are ID doctors. We do a lot of cultures and we respond appropriately there. So my objective today is why this talk? When to suspect chikungunya or flu or how to manage? I'll try to summarize and what is the way forward in the next 30 minutes. This is a 42-year-old. Uh, 42 year old person, farmer by occupations, is coming from Tiruvallu. Fever, headache, body pain of five days durations. He got leg pain, no GI disturbances, no comorbids, vaccinated for COVID, conjunctival suffusions, completed on course of chloroquine, but there is no response. What is your diagnosis now? So, what do you think this patient is now suffering? How many say the patient has got leptospirosis? Please keep uh, put it in the chat column so that we can discuss. How many say this is typhoid? Or how many say this is dengue? Because already the discussions happened between typhoid, dengue, malaria, we are not discussing today. Flu, we are going to discuss today. Chicken gunia, all of the hubbo. When we always put all of the hubbo, people always tempted to know what is going on. Or none of the hubbo, what is your diagnosis? Since this is a talk, somebody say this is leptospirosis straight away. Because of the talk, we put leptospirosis. Or what is the clue here? This patient has got leptospirosis. That's the point I'm asking you. Because the talk is leptospirosis, that's why everybody say lepto, lepto. And people say conjunctival suffusion is the reason for it. Very good response. Very good. Keep, keep answering so that it's easy for us to interact with people in a Zoom meetings. Okay. So I'll give more data now. The patient's viral test has came back. O titer is 1 in 80 is positive and HS1 in 160 is positive. Dengue IgM is positive. Lepto IgM is negative. So what do you think? This patient has got now leptospirosis. Any second thought, I just want to check. People say cough, muscle pain. Now, brucellosis is also coming in mind. But now I've given more lab data. So the Vidal is negative. Vidal is positive. Dengue is positive. IgM is positive. At the same time, lepto IgM is negative. What do you think? People who answered leptospirosis, what is your thought process now? Can you go ahead and answer? So people say, I just check in the odds alone. People say this is chicken gunia. Okay. Dengue. But dengue IgM is positive. Okay, so people say this is dengue. Dr. Nemi Nadan has explained to you like, when to suspect dengue. So people are thinking in terms of dengue now. So a lot of active participation. This give a lot of energy for us to present that. Great. So I'll show some more data. So I'm going to discuss the leptospirosis. Don't think this is a new disease. This is a old disease. So I have taken from William Hostler's book of Practice of Medicines. And in that Wheels Disease chapter, I have taken over. They clearly mention the disease starts abruptly and without any prodromal symptoms, often with the chills. There are headache and pain in the back. Sometimes the patient joint disappears clearly. The liver and spleen are usually enlarged. The former may become tender. The jaundice may be light, but in many cases, described it, it has been an obstructive form. So this is what the Wheels disease was described long back in William Hostler's book there. So this is how the William Hostler described the Wheels disease. That is nowadays is called leptospirosis. So this is not a new disease. This is a old disease. But if you see, this is a global disease. Previously, it is in the tropic. Now leptospirosis moved behind the tropic also. A lot of countries start seeing leptospirosis cases now. 
nowadays. Then if you see in India, previously malaria is number one. People always want to give. When I was doing my undergraduation, post-graduations, any fever, body pain, headache, chills, we need to take smear and we need to give chloroquine empirically or prophylactically or preemptively, we can call it. But nowadays, the malaria is going down, down, down for me. And what is all emerging? Dengue has already emerged. Scut typhus is emerging. Typhoid is seeing a lot of cases we nowadays. And along with flu, COVID. COVID is last couple of years back. Now flu is rampant nowadays. And dengue is again emerging. So these are all the diseases. And lepto. Lepto, particularly whenever people are exposed to the floods, people are exposed to the, some of the monsoons, definitely leptospirosis you should keep in mind. So either yeah, dengue, lepto or COVID. But what happened? Even leptospirosis kill more number of patients according to the, this newspaper article. I do not know the validity of this paper, but this is a newspaper article, particularly in Mumbai. What kills the patients more? Lepto kill more compared to dengue, compared to H1N1. Maybe the diagnosis is missed out. I'm not sure what is the reason for why the leptospirosis is killing more people. We need to check. And second thing, definitely we know leptospirosis, if you fail to make a diagnosis, if you fail to make a diagnosis, leptospirosis is going to kill. That's sure. Any infectious diseases, if you fail to make a diagnosis, either the patients improve, provided the patient's immunity is good, or 10 to 15% of the population, their vulnerable populations, we can call, either because of the immunocompromise, the patients can get and the patient can get death due to the particular diseases is there. Then why we are presenting today or why we are talking today to the IA fever is stopped emerging one. Second thing, what is interesting in the study, what happened when the patient goes to the patient goes to the general practitioners, when the patient goes to the general practitioners, they say the death rate is high. Why? The awareness among the general practitioners suppose the disease is not true. That's what the conclusion they say. If you read the conclusions, this is a public health concerns. In not only in our part, this is in other part also. The awareness among the healthcare professionals is not much. But for my country like India, the study is not conducted in India. Suppose if the study is conducted in India, maybe the results may be entirely different because we are creating awareness through the high MSCGP group. So we are creating awareness. So we got we got a lot of cases like happening here. And people are also aware. That's why people want to know what is taking with dengue, what is taking chicken munia. Everything people are aware of it there. So for this group, if you do the study, the results may be entirely different for me. So why we need to discuss the leptospirosis? Leptospirosis emerges during the monsoon. Leptospirosis kills more patients. Leptospirosis nowadays is global. Not only it is restricted to the tropical country, it is global. Then what is leptospira? Leptospira again is a bacteria. This is a thin curved bacteria, very small one, that 0.1 micrometer in diameter and 6 to 20 meters, 20 micrometers in diameter. It's very difficult to see under the microscope. That is why we are using dark field microscope to visibly see this bacteria. And the heads are curved, the heads, the, 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 the both the heads are curved in. That is why it's called a spiral sheet, but it's become a spiral or the person has got a curved structure, which is called a spiral sheet. And it is very small. All one very difficult to see through the normal microscope. Dark field microscope may help out. Is it possible to culture this organism? Yes, this is possible to culture, but we need to take the sample without antibiotics and we need to use a specific medium called polysorbate albumin media. We need to use it. The availability of this medium, availability of the culture is a bit difficult. Some of the reference laboratories still having it. I'll come back and how to make a diagnosis of leptospirosis in my later part of my talk. And leptospirosis species, because when you send to the lab, they do some species ID. People got confused what to do with this ID. Usually there are two species we can put it. The genus of leptospirosis went to two species. One is called introvans, another is called biflexa. Biflexa is a common non-pathogenic organisms. So do not treat all the leptospirosis report what come to you. You need to differentiate whether it's a pathogenic one or non-pathogenic one. That is most important thing. I'll show some of them common pathogenic species of introgans like Ipohemorrhagica, then Canicola. These are all hostalis, autumnalis, pyogenes. These are all very important, important pathogenic species. So we need to know which species is pathogenic, which species is saprophytic or non-pathogenic. We need to know. Unless we know these differences, people do some uh, microscopic slide agglutination test. Some species name will come in the report. People start treating with the species. So that is not required, one. Then if you know the epidemiology, I told global distributions happen. Previously in tropical, it is more common. Now it's global distributions. Greater in the tropical area and in the tropical area, rural background is more important for the thing. Most of the time, it is underreported. 
because people are not suspecting or people are using an antibiotic called doxycycline or acetromycin that is taken care of the leptospirosis so the hunter reporting can happen. Usually it is maintained in the rodent populations where it is a chronic form. It is not going to kill the rodent. It is just manifesting in the rodents and continue to manifest it, uh, continue to excrete the pathogen. The incubation period is usually 10 days, ranges from 5 to 14 days. The primary route of transmission is usually contact with the contact with the bacteria, particularly while walking in the rainwater, wading in the rainwater. So this history is very important. Don't give the history of leptospirosis. IgM is positive. Leptospirosis mantis is positive. That is not important to me. First thing, the patient should have risk factors. For example, recreational exposures. One. Second thing, exposure to the flood water, not just walking in the rain. Walking in the rainwater where your foot is submerged in the water for quite some time. Second thing, occupational, people working in a muddy areas, for example, farmers, veterinarians, abaters, lab staff, these are the people vulnerable. So we need to take proper history. What is a job? What you did? And household contacts is also possible. Contaminated rainwater, walking in a barefoot, that is more important. Or you can walk in a almost knee feet water, even though you are wearing a foot pair, but you are walking in a knee, knee, knee depth water. Some of the cracks or crack, some of the ulcers in the foot that can source for the, that can allow the passage of the bacteria inside your body. Rarely aerosolization is possible or direct contact with the animal is possible. This is why veterinarians is very vulnerable to this type of diseases. So we need to know the epidemiology. It is happening everywhere in the world. One, but during the time of monsoon season is more common, particularly water exposures or muddy field exposures is more important. So always ask what job is doing, what you did in the last couple of days, that is more important for you. Then what the pathophysiology? Leptospirosis enters through the cuts or abrasions in them or mucous membranes or conjunctiva or sometimes rarely you are inhaling it. After that, it disseminates in the body through the blood system. It can cause a systemic vasculitis and causes some tissue injury. So the animal exposures in the urine, vulnerable person working in the field or walking in the waters get the leptospirosis, goes inside the body. Usually it causes systemic diseases in the form of fever, body pain, leg pain, conjunctive insufficients. Later part, if you fail to recognize, it affects the liver, kidney and lung. Later organ dysfunctions and death is possible if you fail to recognize. So this is a reason we need to respond. We need to identify the organisms a bit early. And it has got biphasic. The first phase is a leptospiremic or septicemic phase. That point of time, the symptoms of fever, headache, body pain and periorbital macroplabular rash will be there. The later part, immune phase, that point of time, only the immune system trying to clear the leptospirosis, producing organ dysfunctions. We need to keep in mind. So coming back to this history, what do you think now? So I've given a history too. So the patient is a farmer. So what do you think? People say cough pain is indications of leptospirosis. For me, the history of farmer and the patient has got fever, headache, body pain. So along with conjunctural suffusions, taken a chloroquine. But only thing, what is against is taken suffixem, but how many days of suffixem is completed, that's more important for me. So Vidal, previous speaker alluded, one Vidal has got very little significance. Unless we do a pad Vidal test, it has got useless. Dengue IgM, again, my previous speaker alluded, false positive can happen. We need to think about it, that dengue IgM can remain positive for longer time, up to three months it remains positive one. And dengue IgM, a lot of false positivities can happen. Usually, IgM tests always take with pinch of salt. That's the bottom line. Any IgM test, don't take with the immediately confirmatory test. Don't consider this is a confirmatory test. We need to think about whether the dengue IgM is really important or not, or any other IgM is really important or not, based upon your pre-test possibility. What is the pre-test possibility of the patients? That's more important. So what's your diagnosis here? Possible leptospirosis. Why are you saying possible leptospirosis? The patient has got typical symptoms of fever, headache, body pain is farmer by occupations because of exposure to the muddy area. He got conjunctive insufficiency and leg cough muscle tenderness is present. So this is why I think possible leptospirosis here. So this is conjunctive insufficiency. Usually we examine the patients. You can get it right now. So if you see what is the common symptoms and signs, we need to go for publications. If you see this is an Indian publication, so almost 74 hot cases, they got published. What is the most common symptom? Headache is most common symptom. Second, followed by myalgia. The body pain is present on 68% of the occasions. Then you can have jaundice. You can have some hemoptysis. Again, the patients might have lymphadenopathy. These are all possible and rash may also happen. So this is a basis of leptospirosis. We need to keep in mind. According to the Indian data, I've shown the pictures now. And this is a beautiful infographic created by BMJ. Leptospirosis means rashes will be there. But if it is full blue, for example, focus a column, 
the fourth one, sorry, I didn't enlight it there. Focus this one. The patient has got rash. The patient has got lymphadenopathy, conjunctive insufficiency, or the patient has got muscular tenderness. Think of it. And thrombocytopenia is also possible. Whether this is a blue one is a mild disease, red one is a serious disease. In serious disease also, the patient might have jaundice. The patient might have respiratory distress is possible. And acute liver cell failure is possible. So this is a beautiful infographic to compare all the illnesses what we are discussing now. Then how to clinically make a diagnosis of leptospirosis? This criteria is called modified Feinstein criteria. They are called scoring systems. One is called Part A based upon the clinical signs and symptoms. Part B based upon the epidemiological exposures. Usually we divide the people into two categories also. One is clinical signs based and second thing is risk factors based. For example, the patient has got fever, conjunctive insufficiency, myalgia, meningeal irritations, jaundice, proteinuria, and along with epidemiological exposure, heavy rainfall, flooding, or animal contact, think about it. So always any infectious disease, the bottom line is, what is the chances of the patient is getting the disease? For example, the previous speaker talking about a typhoid fever, when to suspect typhoid fever, a patient is an young individual, eating most of the time outside food, because this is a foodborne disease. So when a person is eating outside food, whichever food is not cooked, not boiled, vegetable salads, fruit salad, ice cream, juices, pani, pani puri, chutney, curd rices outside, the chances of getting typhoid is very high on the card. So we need to know what is the epidemiological risk factor. What is the risk factor for scrub typhus? Walking in a bushy areas, went to the bushy areas, did some trucking, think about scrub typhus. So when to think dengue, sudden onset, lot of mosquito bites, we need to think about it. So this is a called Feinstein criteria. Clinically, you can suspect leptospirosis based upon the criteria. But if you see the sensitivity and specificity, it's not a great thing. The sensitivity and specificity is not very high. But if you combine some lab report, yes, it is possible. We can make a diagnosis of it. So what is the characteristic feature of the leptospirosis? See this part. The part is combinations of the conjunctive insufficients, ictus, sometimes muscular pain. We need to make a diagnosis. But what is the important clinical where how to differentiate scrub typhus and leptospirosis? Both has got muscular pain. Leptospirosis, muscular tenderness. If you start examining, if you're palpating the muscle, the patients will winch us with the pain. But for scrub typhus, the palpations give relief the pain. So this is a subtle clue we can make able to differentiate lepto versus scrub because lepto and scrub almost closely mimic each other. But in leptospirosis, the person can winch with the pain when you do your palpations, but scrub typhus it may relieve the pain. So coming back to this case. Now you think even though the lepto IgM is negative, I told them clearly IgM serology always take in mind because all IgM serological tests take minimum five days, but ideally after seven days only turn positive. That's the bottom line. So why the test is negative here? The patient does not form the antibody here because minimum time is five days, but it can form after seven days. Yes, I'll show them. Uh, I'll show the like, uh, evidences what is why it is we need to wait. Why dengue IgM is positive? Maybe the patient has got past infections of dengue that is remains still positive. Or sometimes the leptospirosis can cross rate. It's called false positive is also possible. Vidal is a useless test because particularly single Vidal. If you do a Vidal, it can remain persistent for last three to six months also. That is why we never do Vidal in our practice to make a diagnosis of typhoid. So that is useless test we usually consider. Now, is there any clue to such leptospirosis? Yes. What is an important test for a general practitioner? Do the complete blood count. Do LFT test. Based upon the blood count and LFT test, you can make a diagnosis of most of the tropical infections. For example, in dengue, hemoglobin is concentrated. More elevation of hemoglobin will be there. In malaria, the hemoglobin will be a bit low. Typhoid and leptospirosis, hemoglobin may be normal or below normal. Then WBC count. The WBC count is elevated. Think of leptospirosis or scrub typhus. WBC count is below normal. If the 4,000 means below normal, two possibility. Either dengue or typhoid is possible. So differential count, C, eosinophil count. Why the eosinophil count? People are asking. Eosinophil count, usually all intracellular organisms mount a good immune response where lymphocytes overtake and it masks the eosinophil production. But that is not classic of eosinophil. But usually we see in our experiences, eosinophilia is a marker. But eosinophilia can happen with all intracellular bacteria. It's possible there. And second thing, platelet. Platelet may be low. In dengue, it is low. In uh, malaria, it is low. In uh, leptospirosis, scrub typhus will be low. But dengue, it is too low. Slepto leptospirosis and scrub typhus, it varies anywhere between 60,000 to 1 lakh. It is not below 50,000 or below 25,000. That's a clue. Then if you see the LFT test, SGOT, SGPT, alkaline phosphatase. Usually in dengue and typhoid, OT and PT is more. 
because that is hepatocellular pattern. On the other hand, leptospirosis and scrub typhus, they the cholestatic. Cholestatic means alkaline phosphatase may be elevated or bilirubin total bilirubin may be elevated. Sometimes the mixed pattern, both alkaline phosphatase and mild SGOT, SGBT is possible with lepto and scrub. So this is a differential diagnosis and eosinophilia is a marker. If you see the direct bilirubin elevated, leptospirosis or scrub, indirect bilirubin elevated, think of hemolysis due to malaria. So these simple charts can give you a answer what you are thinking about it. Then laboratory diagnosis. What laboratory diagnosis? Culture is a gold standard. Unfortunately, it lacks sensitivity. It is not available also. Cost is not major thing, but its availability is a bit challenging. Specific. Once the lepto culture is positive, it's lepto. It's not a false positive. Dark field microscopy, it is easily available, but the sensitivity is very poor. It's sensitive, but the specificity is hardly nothing. Then people do microscopic slide agglutination tests. Send it to a Madhavaram lab or something. They used to do some references lab, MGR University they used to do. But this is a good test. Again, single titus, high titus has got value, but we need to wait for minimum five to seven days. But what is available practically to everybody is IgM serology for leptospirosis. That is easily available. It is not that costly also. But again, the sensitivity is good, but specificity is not 100%. Lepto IgM positive means it is not lepto. Maybe something else is also possible. But what is the best way to confirm leptospirosis? Ideally, PCR. Previously, PCR was not available freely, but now freely available leptospirosis PCR. For example, the scrub PCR or typhoid PCR available, but not available freely. Leptospirosis PCR available freely. It's not very costly. We can make a diagnosis of leptospirosis on day one, day two. Even for dengue also PCR available nowadays. So there's no need to wait for NS1, IgM, IgG, five days I need to wait, no. In the first week when you think dengue, you can do the dengue PCR. If you think the patient is called leptospirosis, PCR is a way forward we can able to do. Typhoid, couple of hospitals are doing in Chennai. And similarly, scrub typhus, couple of reference labs are doing for PCR. But again, PCR also save both live and dead bacilli, but most of the time it is very specific test. So do, do leptospirosis PCR if you think the patient has got leptospirosis. So if you see the rapid method is going with the leptospira hygium, I mean the rapid test is available, but it is good sensitivity, but specificity is not great. But if you want to make a diagnosis, culture is a gold standard, or you can go with the nucleic acid amplification test in the form of PCR. PCR is available, it is not for that costly also. You can able to make a diagnosis of lepto in day two to day three also. Similarly, dengue. Dengue, a lot of confusions happening. NS1 negative, IgM negative, day 3, day 4, I need to wait for day 5. No, you can do PCR to make a diagnosis of dengue in a week. So coming back to this patients, what treatment you are going to offer for him? Whether you want to treat with the crystalline penicillin or patients for leptospirosis means people always want to give crystalline penicillin. So I want to check how many people want to give crystalline penicillin for a year or ceftrioxone or doxycycline or azithromycin, which is your preferred choice. Just go ahead and vote so that we can have some discussions. I start noticing any voting for these questions. People want to know how they want to treat leptospirosis. People say doxy, very good. Doxy is taking. Doxy is a leader for leptospirosis as far as IMA CGP is concerned. Some people say ceftrioxone. It's a good thing there. So people are not giving weightage to uh, crystalline penicillin. But in private practice, most of the people, once leptospirosis is positive, they ask their patients to get admitted. Because crystalline penicillin has got very short half-life, a lot of allergic reaction is possible. They want to administer CP. Nowadays, CP we are not using for leptospirosis. That's the bottom line. So why I'm not using the CP? This is a reason for it. I'll show in a minute. So on large study compared, ceftrioxone versus penicillin versus doxycycline, they find there is no differences between ceftrioxone and penicillin. Similarly, crystalline penicillin versus ceftrioxone versus doxycycline is compared in one of the large trial. It showed there is no advantage of crystalline penicillin over ceftrioxone over doxycycline. Some people say severe infections, serious infections, even serious infections, severe infections. Now one good NEGM paper published recently from CMC Valor, it shows combinations of doxy plus azithro, that's fine. Or even the combination of ceftrioxone plus doxy is fine if a patient has got serious illness. So there is no advantage of CP because we need to think in mind, Jarish eczema reaction is always possible if you start using penicillin. Then is there any way of preventing? Yes, walking in a rainwater, wading in a rainwater, avoid swimming in unknown pools, then particularly people working in a agricultural field or muddy areas, view shoe covers, that is more important. Particularly during the time of floods, people want to know whether I can take doxycycline. Yes, doxycycline prophylaxis might help out. For patients with ulcers, cut, crack, 
you are going to spend a lot of time. You are a rescue worker. You are a policeman. You don't need to go to stand in the rainwater for a long time. Yes, you need to take doxycycline. Depending upon the risk, what is that? 24 to 48 hours you can take. That can prevent the leptospirosis for you. So these are all the prevention for you. So in summary for leptospirosis, exposure history is more important. Risk factors like rainwater, bushy areas, agricultural fields are swimming. Symptoms should last usually more than five days. Not like your dengue or influenza that lasts for two to three days. Here, yeah, the symptom can block for five days. Headache, body pain, retroorbital pain, conjunctival insufficient is possible. Jaundice and muscular tenderness. If you do the WBC count, WBC count is elevated and platelets are a bit low. More of alkaline phosphatase, more of bilirubin elevations. But when you think what is the ideal test, when you think the patient has got leptospirosis or scrub typhus, start him on doxycycline or acetromycin. If you start him on doxy or acetromycin, there is no need to worry about it because serological tests need to wait for five to seven days. PCR is available, but people not aware of it, but patient not affordable also. If you have got PCR, do the PCR. If not PCR, if not serology, at least, if you think the patient has got exposure history, risk factor present, typical fever, headache, myalgia, congenital suffusions, think of WBC elevated. If you want to start, start, but doxy and acidro, both are equal to me. Acidro, the fever may take a little longer to subside. My next part is flu. People, flu means the people always think now, previously Tamiflu, but in India, Tamiflu is not available. This is anti-flu is only available now. So this case, 55-year-old male, female, systemic hypertensions with a fever, cough of five days duration, no shortness of breath. On examination, crackles were present on both the sides. Investigation, WBC count is 4,500. Lymphocytes is slightly elevated. He has got a grandchild two years, is coughing for the last one week. So the grandchild is start going to the school and he got cough for the last one week. Now the grandfather also started developing fever, cough for five days duration, no shortness of breath. How many want to do confirmatory tests for these patients? How many say, I want to start PCR? Or treat like a pneumonia with give some antibiotics, give some symptomatic therapy, or you want to refer. So I may want to see how many people want to do this one. So almost 490 people are still on online. I do not normally on YouTube, but just go and vote. So what do you think? People want to provide symptomatic treatment alone. People want to do H1N1 tests. What is our policy or aware of H1N1 tests in, right now in Tamil Nadu for people coming to the OPD settings? Because I hear in the community of OPD settings is very difficult to do the test. Government does not want to do the test as an outpatient setting. So keep follow your policy, what government is insisting. Before that, we need to know some nomenclatures. Influenza has got influenza A, B, and C. Among the A, we got hemagglutinations and neuromeridis inhibitor. That is called H1N1, H3N1. Right now, we are seeing more of H3N1, not H1N1. We are seeing H1N1 also. H1N1 is called pandemic strain, the 2009 strain. Other one is called H3N1, H3N2. That is more common. That belongs to influenza A group only. And similar thing is, the patient has got influenza B also we are seeing. And influenza C, we are not seeing. Influenza A and influenza B. Previously, influenza B means mild diseases. But off late last couple of years, influenza B also behaving like a influenza A. What is the bottom line? Whether influenza A or influenza B, we need to treat the same treatment with hostile time is going to work. Then depending upon the country, depending upon the high slates, we can go on. So this is the three types you can remember. Type A can cause disease both not only in humans, but also in other species is also possible. Type B and type C is limited to the humans. Type B and type C previously considered as mild. But nowadays, type C alone is mild. Type B is usually moderate. So vaccines is available for type A and type B. So what is the classic symptoms of influenza? Cough, fever, throat pain, myalgia, headache, rhinitis. These are all the classic symptoms of influenza. But as a tertiary care hospital, what I am seeing in my hospital, it is more of shortness of breath. Because patients got hospitalized. That time only they come to the hospital. We admit the patients only with the shortness of breath. We are not admitting the patients with fever, cough, and sore throat. So in the hospital setting, shortness of breath more important and organ failure, we start seeing a lot of cases. So this is a setting where you are seeing. So when a patient comes to you, how to make a diagnosis of influenza? First thing, the person should have symptoms of upper respiratory tract, fever, cough, running nose, sore throat, nose block, along with the patient might develop shortness of breath possible. But what is most important thing, he visited crowded places. Is not wearing masks. People start removing the mask nowadays. People not wearing masks, going to the crowded places, attended gathering or sick contact, either in the family or in the working stations, office or schools. If you got the patient has got sick contact, 
along with fever, cough, shortness of breath or sore throat, think about it, influenza. This is what we need to think about influenza. But the most important thing, sharp onset of fever, sick contact, they exposed to somebody in the family. Or he may be the first person in the family, but he can transmit the disease. After he started developing symptoms, other family members also got it. So always ask when you think influenza, anybody in the family, anybody in the school, anybody in the office has got similar symptoms two to three days back or any travel, any gatherings, even going to the hospital, staying in the hospital for half an hour to one hour, the risk is there. So we need to ask this type of history to make it. So any crowded, any gathering without mask, without mask, the chances of getting influenza is very high. What about the WBC count? Normal. Neutrophils count is also normal. More of lymphocytes. That's what I shown. The neutrophils is normal. Lymphocytes slightly elevated. This is a muscular pain or body pain. Anything that causes muscular pain, LDH can go up. If you fail to make a diagnosis, particularly when the patient has got comorbid, he may suffer. So this is how the patients got admitted in the ICU with a lot of respiratory infiltrates, both the sides, similar to your pulmonary edema or LV failure. The X-ray may be normal also. It has got ARDS picture, bilateral infiltrates with blown glass opacities. Previously, GGO means people think of COVID. Now, whenever you think of COVID-like presentations, think of H1N1. Nowadays, we are not seeing COVID that much. Or low bar infiltrate like pneumonia, very rare. These are all the classic descriptions. What tests? People during the time of COVID, a lot of rapid tests they did. But for influenza, the rapid test has got sensitivity of 11%. That means out of 10 people, one may be positive. Even though the person has got influenza, the test won't pick it up. So don't do the rapid test and say rapid test negative, I ruled out H1N1. Rapid test is positive, it confirmed it. But rapid test negative doesn't rule out H1N1. RT-PCR is a gold standard. Viral culture will take time. It's not available freely to you. So what is a D-test for H1N1? PCR is a D-test for you. When to do as soon as possible, but up to five to seven days, the positivity rate is very high. As time goes down, the PCR can also negative. That's possible. So when to which sample, nasopharyngeal sample is fine. In ventilated patients, you can take endotracheal samples also. Particularly when a patient is ventilated, instead of taking a nasopharyngeal tube, take from endotracheal tube. If you are not able to transmit as soon as possible, it should be refrigerated but not frozen. That's the most important thing. So when to test? Hospitalized patients with a severe pneumonia, please do H1N1. Elderly persons, infants presenting with suspected sepsis or fever of unknown origin, please do. Persons of any age who develops fever, respiratory symptoms after the hospital admissions. Most of the time, the hospitals are not segregating. So when the person admitted for some reasons, suddenly he started developing fever, shortness of breath, respiratory distress, please do H1N1. Outpatient setting, when a patient has got risk factors, particularly the patient is a post-transplant. According to Government of India, the state of Tamil Nadu, outpatient setting, they don't want to do the testing of influenza. I do not know because this is not a public health reason. This is not like water stagnations or mosquitoes brewing or something there. This is because of the winter, the season, the virus loves it, it's circulated. If you go to the crowded places without masks, I don't think so. This is a public health issue, but still the state government as well as Indian government insisting not to do as an outpatient to check influenza. If you check only, then we know what is going on, but unfortunately, we got a lot of limitations on the government side. Oh, immunocompromised, post-transplant, I need to check. Children with fever and respiratory symptoms, because any point of time they can go into respiratory distress, please check. So, if you don't want to do an individual H1N1 test because government says we can't do it, the patient is affordable. This test is a good test. It's called PCR, multiplex PCR. If you do a throat swab and send for this test, you can be able to identify whether influenza is present or not, which type of influenza, H1N1 or H3N2 one. And second thing, COVID is still present or not. Other respiratory viruses like Rhino, RSV, you can be able to figure out. So this is called respiratory viral panel test. Available, but cost is slightly high. It is not available in the government setup. It's mostly available in the private care sector. It's available freely, but not freely means the cost is there. So we can able to find out what is going on. The turnaround time is one hour. That is more important. The turnaround time is one hour. We can able to figure out which respiratory illness the patient has got in. Coming back to my case history, what will you do now? You made a diagnosis of influenza-like illness. The patient has got fever, cough, some sick contact. So we need to think the patient has got influenza-like illness. Whether you want to start hospital time of it, but the patient is now presenting on day five or day six of the illness. How many say I want to start hospital time of it? So the patient is presenting to me. Cost of the multiplex PCR people are asking 15,000 bucks, but some of the private labs do 12,000 rupees. It can able to do it now. So what treatment you're going to do for these patients? Want to start, but day five, the way we were. Usually when we start antiviral, it starts to be start little early. 
But if you give a little late, the chances of failure may happen. So this is the reason people want to hesitate. So what is a natural course? 90% of the people with influenza recover. But nowadays, what we are seeing, the cough is nagging. The cough is killing the people. Even though the viral fever subsided on day two, day three, the cough goes with influenza for four to six weeks. In fact, a lot of healthcare persons, they themselves are asking, my cough is not going. I tried everything. Four to six weeks, sometimes six to eight weeks, sometimes three months is going on. The last two, three months, people who got H1N1, they are aware of it. Illness only lasts. But most of the patients, complete recovery, I don't think so. One week, the complete recovery means absence of the cough. That is dragging quite some time for this time. Then what are the complications? Pulmonary means we can go with a bacterial pneumonia. Similarly, for extra pulmonary means renal failure, coagulopathy, myocarditis. Whatever we encountered during COVID, all is possible with influenza. Even before COVID, these complications we've seen in influenza. Then how will you approach according to Government of India? Patients with mild diseases or mild symptoms or patients without any comorbid conditions. They belong to category A. No comorbid, mild symptoms. Do not test, do not treat also. But I'll come back and explain what we do. Patients has got category B1 means severe symptoms. Patient has got 101, patient is coughing, patient has got sore throat pain. No need to test, but go for treatment. Immunocompromised patients also, no need to test, treat it. Patients with respiratory distress, we need to test and treat. So category A means healthy person, mild symptoms, do not test, do not treat according to the government of India. Category B means either severe symptoms or immunocompromised, do not test, but treat. Category C, patient has got respiratory distress, treat as well as test as well as treat. That's the policy government of India. But according to me, the patient comes little early, particularly the amount of cough the patient suffering nowadays with the two to three months is dragging. The person comes to you little early, ideally within 48 hours time. That point of time, even the person is healthy, I can start. What is the advantage for me? The transmission risk in the family will go down. The suffering can go down. So that is the reason we need to start little early, even with the patient's presence to you little early, the healthy persons with mild symptoms. Because after the fever, after the body pain, the cough is dragging this time. What is the side effects of oseltamivir? Diarrhea will be there, a lot of headache. But what is the benefit? The benefit, this is a benefit. The patient, the chances of developing pneumonia is a bit less. The chances of going to the ICU is a bit less. That is why we need to start little early, provided the patient comes to you little early. So we need to keep in mind the advantage is that this Lancet paper clearly told you can prevent pneumonia, you can prevent death or something there. So it's very important for you. Then people want to know, I use for COVID time a lot of dexamethasone. But as far as the data, 2009, we tried a couple of cases. Before the dexamethasone for COVID data, we tried. In a small observational study, it is beneficial. But randomized control trial, it is not beneficial. So what I would do, if the patient has got respiratory distress, I can apply the COVID rule here. When a patient is respiratory distress requiring oxygen, that do good amount of oxygen, yes, we can, but not high doses of dexamethasone or high doses of methylprednisolone. What we did in COVID with the 6 milligram to 8 milligram dexamethasone, that is fine. So we can give for a couple of days to see whether the patient's inflammation subsides or not. So coming back to this case, he was treated by a cardiologist. His cardiologist has got a diabetes, but unfortunately, it's a controlled diabetes. He was not wearing a mask. He was attended by a postgraduate, that's a pregnant postgraduate. Again, she is also not to wear a mask. CRRI, asthmatic. Two nurses, one is pregnant, other taking steroids for ulcerative colitis. He has got two grandchildren, one is coughing now. So whom you want to protect? People are exposed to this H1N1 case. During that COVID time, people are exposed to the COVID, they're worried. But now H1N1, people are exposed to the H1N1. What will you do now? Start hassle time for everybody. Give vaccines for everybody. Can we take flu vaccines regularly? People are asking, yes, I'll go answer the discussion there. So first, first answer, how many people say I want to give hostile damage for everybody? So we need to know what, how many people want to give hostile damage. Give vaccine for all. Give both. Watch for symptoms and read. So what people say is give Tamiflu for everybody. Everybody says Tamiflu, Tamiflu. So what we need to do here. Okay. Sorry. One second. Yeah, so this is a category. What I told for the treatment, same thing you can apply for prophylaxis. The person exposed to the H1N1 is an healthy person. Here, there is no healthy person exposed. For example, the CRA is asthmatic, the PG is a pregnant lady, the nurses are one has got steroids, other is again has some comorbid. The attending cardiologist is a attending cardiologist is a diabetic. 
and he's 60 plus. So what we need to do with the person attending exposed to H1 and an healthy person, ask him to take vaccination before the symptom starts. Suppose the attending person exposed has got some comorbid illness, what I shown, take Tamiflu as a prophylactic doses or Arsal Tamivir as a prophylactic doses for 10 days and simultaneously take the vaccines also. The third category, if after taking, after exposed to the symptoms, you start developing disease in the form of fever, cough, or shortness of breath, start treating it. So this is what we need to do. The same rule, what we did for the patients, we need to apply for the healthcare workers. We need to know this rule. So who need to take the vaccination? I give the answer. Anybody above the age of six months, we need to take the vaccinations. How often? Once in a year, ideally in the month of September. Why? Even though the season is going on, but our monsoon season starts in the September, take what vaccine? Quadrivalent vaccine. That is called injectable vaccine. That is inactivated. Inhaled vaccine is not available. Inhaled is a live vaccine. Pregnancy is a contraindication. People say, I got egg allergy right now. There is no concern about egg allergy. We can give everybody above the age of six months. Once in a year, September month, we need to take. What is the side effects? Mild pain will be there. Rarely you can get the fever. So every year we need to take this vaccination. That is good. But during the time of COVID, initially hesitations, later people taken the vaccinations. But for influenza also, 2009, a lot of people taken vaccinations. But after two to three years of influenza over, when they asked to take the vaccination, people are hesitant to take vaccinations. Always vaccine hesitancy, even among the doctors, it is present. That's a concern. Then what mask for H1N1? Ideally, surgical mask is fine. Even for COVID, surgical mask is fine unless you are intubating the patients or doing a CPR. And where to keep the patients? Single room is fine. If single room is not possible, you can keep at a distance of, I got to put in like a two meters distance. That means six feet distance is fine. Keep the windows open. There is no, if you are doing your procedures, wear a 95 mask. So the key is always alert, not putting the mask, taking the vaccination is the best way for preventing H1N1. That is the key point. My last case here, 55 year, 30 year female, primary, five months menstrual, five months of amenorrhea. This is pregnancy she got after the IVF. Fever now three days, body pain, back pain, pain in palms, ankle, knee, skin rashes over the face and limbs are patchy rashes, oral ulcers. Recently treated for dengue three months back. Now the WBC count is slightly elevated. You can apply all the rules what we teach now. Dengue NS1. This is a post test for people attending today. What will you do now? Treat like dengue or nipa. Treat like strep typhus or typhoid. Treat like lepto or flu. Treat like in your own way. Attend high DCMEs and decide in the future whenever IMS CGP is conducting what they are deciding. So I expect what will happen. So before you go for some TNMSC credit points, I expect everyone should has answer. Then only they get a TNMSC credit point for this one. This is a post test for today's CME. So 30 year female, primary, five months amenorrhea, precious pregnancy after IVF, fever of three days durations. So people start putting there before you voting it there. So you need to vote and leave the presentation so that we can get a certificate. People say treat like lepto and flu, okay? Because the session is lepto and flu. Already we discussed. Somebody say chicken gunia. Somebody say three lepto flu. Only four, five responses. All 494 we wanted so that you can get your TNMC credit points today. Treat like lepto flu, treat like lepto flu. Good people start voting. You keep voting there so I will discuss it. So that's better. So chicken gunia start emerging now again. So people fail to recognize this is the case what I sent there. The dengue PCR is not detected. Chicken gunia PCR is detected. So PCR for chicken gunia is also available. And in Haryana, they mentioned about 321 cases. But I've started seeing almost 25 to 30 cases in last four to five days itself. Chicken gunia start emerging. How to differentiate? Similar fever, point pain, but more of pain in the palms, pain in the haggle, pain in the knee. Some rashes is also happening. It is not a diffuse rash. It's a patchy rash. Some oral ulcers. Think about it. So when a patient has got joint pain, more and WBC count is more of elevated side. It's not a normal chicken gunia. Dengue is more of normal. Whatever I see in chicken gunia, the WBC count is on higher limit. It's not very high, but now available at 10,000, 11,000. And similarly, the neutrophils also predominant. And mild rash is happening, not a diffuse rash, mild rash. And more of the joints of the hand and joints of the ankle. And again, the stiffness is not great. In 2007, 2008, people are crippled. But right now, people are suffering for 10 to 14 days. So keep vigil. So unless and a lot of vaccines also are discussing. This is yesterday IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America conference in US. They're discussing about the vaccinations, but vaccination is not yet available. But PCR test is available. So PCR is available not only for chikungunya, dengue, leptospirosis, all PCR is available. So how to approach any fever in the tropic? First thing, whether the patient is stable or whether the patient is unstable. How to find out? Use Q so far. 
whether the patient is conscious, whether the respiratory rate is good, systolic BP is good or not, that is more important. Then whether the patient has got septic or not septic for stool. If you are able to say the patient is not septic, any organ, for example, the patient's fever, dysuria, uh, urgency, urinary tract infections, fever, cough, shortness of breath, pneumonia, fever, seizures, altered mental status, meningitis. If you know, find out whether any localizing symptoms or signs, any particular organ we are able to figure out means don't apply the rule. Then what day the person's presence to you? Stable patients without any localizing symptoms comes to you on day two, day three, give paracetamol and observe the patients. The patient's presence day three to day five, do some basic tests, CBC, LFT. But more than five days, we need to investigate. If you do these things, unnecessary antibiotic, unnecessary lab tests can be avoided. That's what they did in one of the small hospitals in Chennai. They did and executed well, and they showed the benefit. For solving the problem, we need to take proper history. For example, dengue means sudden onset of fever, rash will be there. Step typhus, bushy area. Typhoid, eating out. Leptospirosis, walking in the rainwater. Flu, sick contact. So we need to know what history to elicit from the patients. And what tests we need to do. Malaria, don't go with symptoms alone. We need to do the test because malaria numbers has gone down. So please do the test. Typhoid, don't do the viral. Look for eosinophilia or blood culture. Scrub typhus, history, elevated WBC, liver parameters. Either do the scrub IgM after five to seven days, or if you got access to the PCR, do the PCR. Otherwise, give either doxy or acitro, depending upon the pretest possibility. Both for scrub and lepto, same thing. Influenza, sick contact, always PCR, not for antigen. Dengue, again, PCR is gold standard nowadays, is available, or you can go with NS1 antigen, only symptomatic therapy. Brucellosis, yes, cultures is ideal thing. Serology, always take pinch of salt. So sharp onset of fever, dengue, three to five days. The fever not lasts more than seven days. Abdominal discomfort can present. Macular pepper rash will be there. In typhoid, young people, outside eating, bubble disturbances, say the diarrhea or constipations, no response. Walking in the rainwater, wading in the rainwater, leptospirosis. Linfluenza, sick contact, sore throat, shortness of breath. The, the formula I already discussed it. So anybody want to learn more ID, please feel free to contact. Anybody wanted the clinic, tell you ID support. For me, I'm dealing with a lot of uh, seasonal fever, so I'm not able to figure out. I'm not able to remember whatever you thought. Just please feel free to call us. We can provide a support to you. So this is what we can do. And the certificate course is also coming up there. So please feel free to contact me, learning this ones. So thanks for the wonderful opportunity. I'll take a couple of questions, whatever you posted in the chat box. So I'll just... The role of antibiotic to prevent secondary bacterial infections, especially children, there is no role. Unless the patient has got second spike, that's called biphasic illness. The patient is initially improved again, fever, chills, and rigor. Yes, you can take it. Otherwise, there is no role for... Uh, prophylactic antibiotic. It increases the resistance to you. That's why we are not doing it. Then people are asking about leptospirosis, answering only they're fine. We please keep people asking the questions I can answer. On all the three topics we can cover, whatever things left out I can answer. Immunological syndrome, treat like lepto, chikungunya. A lot of people responded to the questions. Very good. That's a very good sign there. So you can keep asking there so I can answer the thing. Very useful message, sir. Very nice presentation. Thanks for your comments. Please go ahead. When hostile tumor in children, usually when the person's children is a category A, the person's presence to you a little early, you can give it. There's no contraindications. Only thing, the diarrhea, you need to keep in mind. Apart from symptomatic treatment, any specific thing for chicken No. In 2007, people used hydroxychloroquine, but during COVID time, hydroxychloroquine failed, so we are not thinking more. And scrub typhus presence with low WPC count, yes. These rules are what I have shown is 95% sensitivity, not 100% sensitivity. Sometimes we can see the septicus with the low count also possible. Treatment of cough, which is persisting. Yes, we know it's going for four to six weeks. People are trying with a lot of things like uh, uh, what do you call digital carbamycin, giving good relief, a good cough suppressants. Remote possibility, some of the worst GPs are using like a steroid, but we usually say like a steroid in as a worst scenario, not as a oral steroid. You have revised everything, sir. Not everything I revise. This is approach I'm doing in my practice. Uh, need frequent classes? Yes, we are happy. If you follow us, we can provide a lot of classes to you. Can we start for a continuous coffee still? Then? No. Yeah, nebulization is fine or inhalation is fine. That's what people are doing it there. There's no clear-cut answer for the thing because we see a lot of things. Drug for pediatric lepto. Previously, doxycycline is a bad drug for children. But nowadays, we are using doxycycline even for newborn. So one time we can use. There's no teeth discoloration, nothing. But if you're really worried, you can use acithromycin. There is no big differences between doxy and acithro. Anything is fine. 
please can you tell the cbc interpretations one more time to differentiate wbc count elevated think of leptospirosis and strep typhus wbc count normal dengue or typhoid differential count lymphocyte elevated virus eosinophil count absent typhoid sgot sgpt more elevated that's called hepatocellular pattern think of uh, dengue versus typhoid alkaline phosphatase ggtp cholestatic picture think of lepto and strep typhus text on with the phone yes most of the thing like a syrup what is working for you you can use it because that's what we are saying dec is used for chronic cough yes we can use one trial because there is no specific recommendation this depends upon individual preferences practical useful clear presentation thanks for your comment for covid patients present with the fever body pain shortness of breath still we can use the remdesivir there's no contraindications for remdesivir it's available also maybe given acetaminophen for fever yes we can give can be anti flu for children in country is cough no if you start early the benefit is good but if the patient does not shortness of breath the patient is not having systemic sense there is no rule for anti flu after 5th day or after 7th day only before 2 to 3 days that's ideal is doxy 400 mg start followed for severe for routine cases 100 mg bd is fine prolons for pediatric prolon is a drug we should avoid all drugs will work for typhoid except ciprofloxacin ofloxacin you can use azithromycin you can use cefixime you can use amoxicillin you can use cortrimoxazole even you can use chloramphenicol but not quinolone quinolone resistance is 90% and i chloroquinol is gone we need to prove all malaria by means of peripheral smear or rapid cart test rapid cart test available even in the rural part so you can do the rapid cart test don't use chloroquine for fever not for for a uh, chikungunya is possible because the pain is persisting but not for malaria Budesonide nebulization. That's what I say. There is no specific guidelines for a prolonged cough following a post-viral infections. You need to design your own protocol. Cough syrup roll. Yes, people using as a placebo. It's a placebo. Or you can play the mind of the patient. Give some cough syrup. But some of the cough syrups containing cough suppressants, you can try that one. For example, codeine is a good cough suppressant. Unfortunately, it's not available nowadays because it's available in the combinations. Government is banned. Doxycycline growth stunting. No. Usually for a newborn, also we try. paper shows one course of doxycycline for newborn can be given after second courses or third courses only we need to resuscitate more of team discolorations not the growth growth is because of the ciprofloxacin in the cartilage state that is also now clear we can use ciprofloxacin in ofloxacin not for typhoid but for other urinary tract infections you can use it high fever supposedly a paracetamol that depends upon whether the child is taking orally give oral if the child is not taking supposedly may be tried so can we give a acetol there is no specific guidelines you need to use your practical experiences what is working for you read what sort of cough whether it's a dry one or productive one depending upon the dry or a productive one you can use it dry cough has codeine but unfortunately codeine brands are nowadays not available because people are abusing that one role of montag we had a discussions in a group yesterday allergic type of cough montag can helpful but other classes montisar is not that much helpful there antibiotic combinations usually preferred to one drug is preferred But if you think if you want to come down the fever little yari, you can use the third generation ciprofloxacin plus acetromycin can cut down the durations of the fever one day. There is no major advantage except the fever can subside one day. Typhoid fever will take minimum six to seven days for fever to subside. Does acetro have antiviral? No, we not not use antiviral in COVID. Clearly demonstrated, acetro has got no role. Toxicycline has got no role for viral. Even for dengue, it has got no role. Pediatrician malaria, yes, same thing as adult. Only thing dosage modifications. If you think the patient has got falciparum malaria, artemisinin and derivative. If you think Vivax malaria, chloroquine. Only thing based upon milligram per kilogram. Experience network issue. Just discontinued and joined again. Fine. And any elaborate much information is fine. I think we are overshooting. One of our is covered. Huh? So I just leave it to the other things. I can respond. I give my number. Please go ahead and answer. So we can feel free when we put the answers for you there. So thanks for the opportunity. If you want to learn further, please keep this number. Or if you want to get a clinical consult, it's also possible. The Delhi ID consult is possible. If you want to learn more courses on this, please feel free to contact. Till the end of sessions, we have seen almost four sixty odd people. Very good sessions. Thanks for the organizers keeping people engaged. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind, nice lecture in an elaborate manner. I congratulate all the three speakers for their wonderful. Uh, session with full attendance thank you all for the nice presentation everything with the differential diagnosis and everything thank you sir all
ஆஹ் ஐஎம்எஸ் சிஜிபிடி மென்படி சார் நான் இப்ப சொல்லிடுறேன் ஹம் சார் டை ஓகே ஹலோ ஆடியோபிள் சார் ஐ வாண்ட் டு லேர்ன் மோர் ஓகே वी கேன் कांटेक्ट us so that we can teach you there thanks for the opportunity because uh, running late of time so we just wind up the thing but we try to answer those who want to get the answers for your specific questions please whatsapp the message number what we provided all the faculty is willing to answer no problem there and if you want to get our slides also shared we can provide the sharing of the slides uh, thank you iom cgp for organizing a wonderful cme and people are engaged that's more important till the end people are waiting more than 400 people are waiting in the uh, zoom meeting the 500 is a maximum limit and we got how youtube also that i think nobody is proposing the word of thanks thank you for the opportunity thanks for participations thanks for the wonderful naga presentation by my previous speakers and participants yes. i request to dr chanmu sudaram to give a word of thanks i'm signing off there thank you hello dr chanmu sudaram so on behalf of the iim cgp i thank all the members i thank especially for the speakers for their one inspiring the time for the cgp i thank all the participants for this wonderful session thank you sir i am audible hello am i audible thanks for thanks i am on behalf of the iim cgp i thank all the members for participating in this zoom meeting Con- as as the cme program thanks to the speakers and everybody thank you all thank you sir tendil tendil hello ab mudichirthenga idu pidichirthu thana pesitta ella idu pannitta avaru sudarthukku kootta avaru unmute pannama appadi vechirukkar pol irukku 